Eric, it's an epic showdown. There's no way of talking about this episode other than saying it's a confrontation. It's a duel of the fates episode one style. There will be one victor. Two fighters enter the octagon. One emerges a champion. That's what's going on today. If if people like Phil Donahue or they like Jerry Springer um, or if they like the typical political debate they say on, on television, you're in for a treat today. This is blood sport. This is Jerry Springer. This is Star Wars. Uh, but both men are both each other's father and son. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Lucifer battling uh, Michael. Yep. Uh, th- this this is fallen angels, fire and brimstone, uh, Dante's Inferno, Paradise Lost. Yeah. We're talking uh, Titans versus the New Gods. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking Olympus crumbling under the weight of, of monsters and Titans fighting it out. We're talking epic journeys across the sea, the Odyssey, Homer. We're talking Beowulf, <laughs> Grendel. Uh, man, I, I'm, I'm actually broken into pieces but barely alive. You can see my disembodied head. Um, You're like you Osiris. You see the other guy. Yeah, I'm like Osiris. Yes, well, bring it back. Battling set. Oh my God! <laughs> I tell you what, the pantheon is in chaos as the the, the head gods are battling uh, across all cultures, time, space. Um, but you should see the other guy. Yeah, yeah, and he uh, he's looking pretty jack, Coach. If I'm being honest. Yeah, I mean the parts of him that are still connected to his spine. Oh yeah, no, you 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 definitely. It was like a Mortal Kombat get over here fatality, kind of like from Mortal Kombat three where they had animal fatalities. So you morphed into this giant mythical dragon and you just pop, bit the head off. Yeah, animality. Oh yeah, and see, he knows, he knows. And for the three people that know, what's up? We got Mike Isratel, our probably it might be third, I might be incorrect, returning guest here today. For several different reasons, but I saw both myself and Eric. Eric actually was at EPC, the European Powerlifting Conference, where everyone was presenting. Mike was there. And then he made an Instagram post just showing a lot of intellectual humility, examining himself, maybe some of his potential faults, critically taking a look at everything that he's done and how he can improve. And I found it immediately refreshing and improved my confidence in his ability to discern not only right from wrong, but how he approaches a variety of topics and the openness to change his opinion. And that serves as a jumping stone for all of us to look internally. And that's part of the journey with Iron Culture where you know we say science, history, um, lifting. And one of the things is for us to look inwards on this journey of self-betterment, not just in the iron physical sense, but also maybe when it comes to us inside, the man inside. Yeah, I mean, I would say he was definitely looking at the man in the mirror. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I, I was just really impressed by it. It was something that elevated my level of respect for Mike when he posted that and also made me just reflect positively on, I think, how far the fitness industry has come, um, where I would say not too long ago, A, uh, science played a, a much more minor role in the way people approach fitness and strength training. Um, but not only has, you know, hashtag science now become a problem and a thing, and there's, you know, the positive side of that we talked about in our last episode, but there is a cultural change in that um, true rational skepticism and humility in attainment of knowledge is something that is coming to the forefront rather than not too long ago as science was on the rise, it was just a different weapon used by gurus. Uh, and it was just really pleasing to see that not only did Mike feel very comfortable uh, with really exposing all of his, what he felt were his intellectual flaws and in a way that was constructive and moving forward and to help his audience uh, better parse the information he puts out, you know, just basically a disclaimer about me. Hey, know this when you read my stuff and here's also what I'm trying to work on, but that it was so positively well received when I think maybe 10 years ago, people wouldn't have known what to do with that because the whole reason they follow you is that you put on the image of the science-based guru who is never wrong and that the goal would be to win every battle, to win every argument and always be the smartest guy in the room and dig your heels in and make everyone else feel intellectually small. It's almost like getting the first call out on a bodybuilding stage, but 
for your, your the rigor of your information and how right you are. Right. No, I, I think you nailed that. And when you said he exposed himself, I can confirm Mike exposes himself. Um, mm -hmm. I've had the pleasure, and that's why we've been talking about a trip to Russia. We collaborated before for the Boris Shako project. I just enjoy him as a human being, hearing him talk. So to have him back on and to examine, to have a not a play by play of a self examination, but how he approaches things and then how he tries to improve kind of mirrors to me the overall lifting journey that we try and make once again, of self-betterment. So I, I could say for myself, I've tried, I need to continue, and I'll continue to do uh, so. But this journey that we're all on, it's not just physical. It's the last thing that I'd mm -mm. say. I mean... No, and I think, I, think, I think you said it well. I like how you tied into lifting because as we all know, there's plenty of those lifters who only train the lifts they're already strong at, only train uh, the body parts that already look good, and, and they're just basically trying to capitalize on the things that make them feel good and never notice that, oh, my God, I have huge glaring uh, either functional or aesthetic holes in my, my, my development. Uh, and that's something that we, we, we understand is a problem in the gym. We understand with the iron, and this is the, the intellectual and emotional version of that, so bringing that in, into the real sphere. And like you said, Mike really did a great job of exposing himself here. Uh, he's got a lot of experience exposing himself. Yep. And all I can say is join us as that trench coat is open the whole time. And you're going to learn another use of Kit Kat bars. Stay tuned. See, Mike just does not even want to participate because he knows. I don't know I was supposed to be clapping. He's not, he's not a collectivist. He's, he's an a critical thinker, which is interesting. For those that don't have video, I'm going to explain what's in front of those, in front of their steaming naked eyes. We have a man in blue. A man wearing a beanie, um, someone with a PhD that goes by the name of Eric Helms, who is liking himself to Luke Skywalker. And I think the bluish hue on your screen, ah, maybe, maybe fitting, even though green was the lightsaber used in Return of the Jedi. Who knows? And then we have Mike Isretel on the other side. And there is legitimately a slight reddish hue because you're using an incandescent bulb, I feel like, in your house. And it's, it's just called a trend tan. Okay. Oh. Oh. oh okay. <laughs> it's just his blood pressure, <laughs> just, yeah. actually. It's yeah. permanent there. Well, it looks great. And it's for those that are interested in color theory, the red and blue on the screen is working. Let me just say. That's the yeah. number one demographic target of this podcast is color theory enthusiasts, I guess. Oh, yeah. I, I like how Omar worked so hard to find a way to pit us against each other in the first few seconds that he went with the slight blue. Like, how blue do I really look? I, I don't not seeing that. On my side, blue, but I also have F flux on, so it probably distorts things <laughs> ever so slightly. Yeah. You're pretty blue. Yeah, that's, maybe that's, it's that's an emotional probably... blue. It's like kind of blue yeah, Miles I, I, Davis, you know? I nice, yeah. and I don't know that everyone else is going to see your F flux. In fact, yeah. I really hope not, or we need to work on our podcast production. But that's okay. <laughs> What what we said, Mike, I don't know. So Mike was actually, and this is great because people will hear you all HD like high definition audio as we say uh you're on one of our first episodes where we were eqing everything trying to get it right the audio was okay video too you're back now with our increased production we like to say around here mike mm. there is cinematic quality right where we have the greats of the greats the kubricks and so forth uh then there's cinema that's around today so popular stuff so marvel's cool cgi very neat it's like around here cool and then there's tv it's somewhere down here home videos down here then there's porno pornography for the more most part and we're kind of just there's porno and now we're here when we started we were below but i'm pleased to say i feel confident in saying we've made tremendous improvements i think that's a potential new shirt for the rascal line yeah. iron culture slightly better quality than porn yeah i could just see that be our tagline but not as fun on the back it just says but not as fun on the back Oh, well, I, I think that depends, really. And maybe that's the diet in me speaking, but I don't know. Well, I, I gave you the perfect layup, and I could tell you're still dieting because I was basically alluding to improving and self-improvement and personal improvement here. Right. Which is kind of one of the topics that we're Let talking about Let me take that today. natural segue <laughs> that you didn't have to explain. <laughs> let me let me let me stop the bleeding in my nose and pick up the basketball. <laughs> Fortunately, there's no defenders, which is just we're playing just basically catch you and I. Um, <laughs> and so we have Mike Ezertel on not to talk about MRV, uh, not see you guys to later. Talk, <laughs> not to talk about. <laughs> I have nothing to say. Yeah, but rather to speak about uh, self-assessment, 
not buying into your own hype, uh, determining how you can improve, and really what I think is a quintessential feature of someone who is a good educator. So, so props to the man. For those who weren't aware, uh, you recently posted on your, your social medias not too long ago uh, what I would describe as a critical self-assessment of your, your strengths and weaknesses. Is that, is that how you would describe it, Mike? Probably more of my weaknesses, but yes. <laughs> I yeah, don't no, think that's I right. There weren't any strengths. strengths. That's, that's true. <laughs> I could still bench a lot. You know? Yeah, like fucking arms are big. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us more about your, um, your, your motivations behind that, why that's important. Um, g- give us an insight into the mind of Israel when you made that post. You know, I was heavily sleep deprived on a trip uh, way outside of my time zone. <laughs> so, yeah, like it was a mistake, actually. <laughs> yeah, I was like, "Oh shit!" I hit post. I <laughs> thought I was hitting delete. This is uh, a everything. Per- this is a personal <laughs> note for myself. Damn. Shit, it. I'm on a podcast <laughs> discussing this shit still. Yeah, Mike, 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 you thought How does your this plane, keep happening? You thought your plane was going to crash, so you wanted people to favorably look upon you, and so you're like, "Let me be. Uh, let me show some humility before it goes down." And then they're like, "Wow, this guy." Yep. And you're like. Every time there's turbulence, I just do the dumbest posts. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> so I was sleep deprived to some extent, um, but also I oh, was really, I just couldn't sleep. So it was time to sleep in the England, but it was not time to sleep in the United States. And I just had, you know, had had a day, I guess a weekend of just, it was, it was actually one of, it was after the, the EPC, is that what it was? EPC, the uh, European Powerlifting Conference? Yes, you nailed um, it. It was I, not yeah. after we were at the UEBC, it was the second time. <laughs> right, <Yeah>. yes. And <laughs> um, it was like probably one of my favorite conferences ever, um, specifically because, uh, I guess a couple of reasons, the, the attendees are all, and all these things are super cool, so that's kind of a constant but I was with uh, some folks that I look up to and people I really enjoy and people also like, um, and me, yeah, you were, hold on, you're get your own category. <laughs> oh, just you wait. Um, also Eric Helms was there. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, so, he wasn't able to ruin it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but like, you know, um, people who, um, I sort of already know. And then people I sort of didn't, uh, Jordan Feigenbaum, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum in particular, and we were sort of able to have really, really awesome discussions and everyone sort of said their piece and their presentations. And then we had like these really awesome round tables that were really just a very thought provoking. Um, and it was really awesome to see people, you know, discuss and, and debate topics with uh, a good, a good margin of respect while at the same time being open to being a bit vulnerable, you know, like, uh, like your, your idea is being criticized. What do you think? And that was really, really awesome. And at the same time, I was also approached by several people uh, during that time, and they had all sorts of really very super nice things to tell me about um, how much of an impact I had made about them, and how great I was, and so on and so forth. And um, I, that that part, but always, I have to very much be careful to preface that it's never a bad thing to receive a high degree of compliment from anybody. Jesus Christ, look at me. If I can get any compliments, you know what I'm saying? It's a good day. Usually people just throw garbage at me in the street. <laughs> for what I assume is just an analogous act to communicating the fact that I'm hideous. I like think if you you're just garbage, that. you don't have to yeah. say anything. It's all I, been said. I think you're just so massive, Mike, that they want to keep feeding you. Like, he clearly, he needs a lot of food. Yeah. For the love Here's of God, the... throw him garbage or you'll eat somebody. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deterrent, yeah. It's kind of like the blob. You know, you're like, oh, he, this will just disappear. And I think it'll be better for global warming. So totally, throw 100%. Him. I'm carbon neutral. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> you can quote me on that. Uh, but ever, anyone who's been around my farting knows I'm not carbon neutral. As a matter of fact... <laughs> I if we even swear on the show, we can swear. You can do whatever you want, man. My my asshole is like a like a like a like a like a PCB spray bottle. Like that's all it does. Mm, it's just, nice. So anyway, so anyway, maybe that's why people are throwing things. But it's always awesome to get compliments. But every now and again, I think when when folks, uh, especially I'll just speak for myself, when I get enough compliments, I should get this interesting emotion sort of rising up within of like, oh man, I, I'm like really good, you know, and this like. Um, it's uh, it's something that bubbles up, and if for some reason I have this reflexive tendency to sh- sort of shit test myself, uh, to be like, am I really that good, or is this feeling of being amazing bounded in any realistic way uh, by my, you know my inadequacies? 
And then so I just started thinking, it's almost a reflex, like I got a compliment and I think, oh, that's very nice. And then if I get a lot of them, it sort of overwhelms, I get compliment overreach. And then I get like a sort of super compensation effect of like, well, but really you're not shit, you know? And it's not like, like you know, if I'm tested for self-esteem, I have high self-esteem, I, I honestly do. I think I'm fucking fine, I think I'm great. But I, I have a tendency to just be, have a, a really high aversion to excessive self-praise in my own head. So like if someone ever wants to say nice things to me, I always and only feel amazing about it. But then when I say nice things about myself to myself in my own head, I'm like, eh, is that really true? And then some of it might be true. Um, you know, uh, I could potentially list some, you just said like a strengths and weaknesses. I could potentially list some as what I think are strengths of mine. Is it always sounds egotistical and fucking weird, but there's the illustration of that mechanism again. Like it's even difficult yeah. for me to say them because it's going to come back and be like, but hold on. Right. So I got all these, but hold ons in my head after all these compliments and I just wrote them down and I realized that, um, I, I didn't realize it then, but I sort of, uh, after posting, you know, some people were like, gee, like, do you keep running tabs on your inadequacies and I'm like man you know what like uh if you want uh sort of an expose a compendium an encyclopedia on my inadequacies i'm the number one authority for that shit um i don't know why maybe it's ashkenazi jewish like guilt or some shit <laughs> like that but like i am profoundly aware of my shortcomings and it's like the eminem rap battle scene where like he it disses himself so bad the other guy's like i got nothing like i sort of I don't know if I make sure to do that in my own head, but it just kind of happens and it tends to, to form this balance of got some good shit going for me, but I got some shit that I'm not that great at. And I think my goal spiritually is to just be at peace and see myself as someone who has these things about them. And some of them are good and some of them are not so great. And I have exceptional abilities and I have limitations. And at the end of the day, you just see it all and you go, oh, this is me. And then maybe if I want to get better at some things, I can work on those problems. Alternatively, because of specialization and trade, uh, maybe some of those problems I'm not even going to work on and I'll let other people take them. Like, like a quick example, I wouldn't get into this much more. Like I don't do a ton of sort of super, super, super in-depth references for every statement I ever make when I write. But like, I, I, am I really going to start referencing things a ton? No. Cause like, man, there's like a Krieger, Schoenfeld, Knuckles, you guys, like you do all that shit already. So like, maybe I should just put my own little spin, you know, like sometimes, you know, like reading things with excessive references is fucking baller, but it's also kind of painful. Sometimes you're like, Jesus Christ. Like I know this one, like Bertoli at all 2003. I've read that thing 15 fucking times. I don't even know what's in my head anymore. Sometimes it's cool to just lay out ideas. So if I understand that my lack of specific referencing is a distinct weakness, maybe it's not on me to improve that because you don't have to improve all your weaknesses. Like, like you guys suck at endurance races. That doesn't mean you're out there like, well, it's fucking better me, better new day. I got to fucking get better at marathons. Like, maybe that's not on you, but it certainly pays to not believe that you're amazing at marathons when you're clearly not. And then sort of put put forth your, your best efforts accordingly. So I think it's probably a good thing to know a bunch of your weaknesses um, so that you can sort of very calmly look at them, including your strengths. And, and, and when you ask yourself, how do I go forward and how do I become a better person? You, you do an analysis of your strengths and your weaknesses, and you may pick some weaknesses to improve or some strengths to improve. And then there you sort of, you're never caught off guard. So to me, my nightmare would be like, you know, sort of looking back at 10 years of being in the industry and, or somebody like super honest and close to me being like, you know, people think like you're a cocksucker, right? And you'd be like, what the fuck? I didn't know that. Like, or people think mm. like you're this and that bad thing. I'd be like, it's not that like, oh, well, you know, my ego can take it. I'd just be like, fuck, I'm smarter than all those people. Fuck them. But like, I don't want to provide like a really shitty service to people by like, just like basically you know, believing my own hype for this whole time or these massive holes in what I'm putting out uh, as far as value provision is concerned. Now, I'm not going to name names. I could, okay, I could easily name names. Well, there are some people that believe their own hype and they're almost all the worse for it because they make these predictable errors they never seek to recognize. Yeah. No, I, I think um, I, I can definitely think of examples of people who have gotten worse over their career. And in every case, it's someone who uh, you can tell their ego is driving the bus. Um, and it's manifested in different ways. You know, you could see someone who came from a very insecure place who uh, really, really fed off uh, the, the, the praise they've gotten uh, because it's, it's become a replacement for a lack of true self-esteem. Um, or you can see people who came from an era where I think we had science-based fitness experts, but we didn't necessarily have rational skepticism baked into it. 
So, uh, you know, no, no offense talking about about someone who's not alive anymore, but kind of the the era of Charles Poliquin, the way I look at that, I remember the late 90s, early 2000s, it was still guruism. You established yourself as a guru and one of the tools was science and you did want to be scientifically accurate. Uh, however, it was so important to kind of still have that macho meathead culture aspect to you being like, oh, the guru is just like Mr. Olympia, but intellectual. Like undefeated. Illusion of certainty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Undefeated, uh, the, the smartest guy in the room, no matter what room they're in, you, you win by being right. I came up in this culture on the forums. You know, you like, you have to know your shit. And, and there's uh, e these ego-based battles of seeing who can be, be the most right. Um, and I think while that is a very useful tool when you're on the forums, you're open to it, and you use that as a way to sharpen your blade, there's a big difference to when you get to a certain level of status, buy into your own hype, and then your goal is to be right all the time. It keeps you focused on science. It keeps you um, aware of science. It keeps you quote unquote science based, I would say, but it prevents you from being a rational skeptic because your ultimate goal is not having the most accurate inter interpretation. It's making sure that everyone else believes your interpretation yes. is people the- People think that you're right. Mm -hmm. Correct. You want people to think you're right and you want your interpretation of research to be the dominant one. Uh, and you want people, and, and, and you can tell in the language of people who do that where uh, your first go-to is misrepresenting others, straw man attacks, condescension, uh, spamming, and, and, and doing what you can to discredit others rather than just presenting a logical argument. So like I've seen both of these things emerge where people like their mission statement seems to have changed from I'm going to be out there doing Q&As and helping people to I'm basically just, you know, Kim Kardashian with muscles. I've got it all figured out. Well, there's almost two different archetypes. There's the I've become just this look at me where I'm now like the, the fame is more important than what I got famous for. Uh, and, and now I'm talking about politics and I'm you know, talking about my personal life. And I'm like, I don't care about your, your marriage or your political I don't views. care like, about I'm... my own personal life, man. I can't <laughs> well, it's, e it's easy when you don't have one. When you stay indoors so you don't get garbage thrown at you, I get it. Like I know the oh, real it's... reason you do, you do the whole online thing is because a brick and mortar would just result in you getting assaulted. What do you with, mean with by tomatoes. the online thing? Are you a Patreon subscriber? I... I can't comment on that. I, I was told I'd have an, an anonymity. Okay. Many camps. Now, now I'm, like I'm, I'm from, going down a step. From right? if, if, yeah. I mean, hypothetically, if I was a Patreon subscriber, I would be going down to the next level of the RP. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm Joe Bob 23 from Many Camp. Hey, man, dude, you're fucking hey. crazy. Uh, you know, I got things, you know, <laughs> I am interested in a variety of different things and I appreciate the services you provide. By the way, the yeah. guy that tried to do that thing you requested, you'll be happy that his broken leg is healing one time. Okay. Um, he's going to try it as soon as he gets out of the hospital. Yeah, I heard he tried to claim his disability due to workplace occupational hazard. So hopefully that's, yeah. Okay. Hey, I just want to say, in all seriousness, from being someone, the only lad here without a PhD, and looking to some individuals such as uh, both you, Eric, and Mike, um, the intellectual humility that I saw you display, uh, Mike, was very encouraging because something that I noticed as an outsider now, and I want to get both of your perspectives, uh, to let's say the evidence-based crowd where you know, you're uh, contributing to research, you're at that high level, right? So as an outsider observing into that world, um, of course, it's a given when it comes to YouTube that a lot of ego because it's instant gratification, you post a, a video that uh machismo kind of style we're talking about before eric or the certainty where you want to present unequivocally you know what you're talking about right so it makes sense on youtube and that's why when i meet individuals influencers fitness youtubers i'm not surprised where when there's an ego and i myself i know i have an ego so it's not it's not surprising to me right it's kind of one of the givens sort of like yeah. oh you meet a wrestler like yeah they're probably going to be a little cocky cool okay i get it right um but what surprised me about the evidence base, and I'm not going to name any names myself here, but from interacting with a wide variety, and there's a select few that I put into the next category that would be as maybe I perceive them, I noticed quite a bit of ego and kind of that idea when you said, Eric, of not quite guru worship, but I know what's best and you should follow me. And a lot of those things that I, I thought would be separate from that category because you're trying to reach for that higher form of educating people, uh, giving them the correct information. It was suspiciously absent in some of my interactions. And so it was slightly surprising as that outsider 
coming from a YouTube space and being like, yeah, like it's a given. Like these guys have, you know, a lot of egos, no shit. Coming into the evidence based crowd and seeing that there's quite a few people that remind me strongly of YouTubers. Is this something, one, that you guys have encountered, but two, why, why do you think, as maybe uh, Eric said, that level of rational skepticism uh, is not present amongst some of these educators, despite them having such a high place, being so high on the pedestal? We're kind of, as your value goes up, the way that I view it, as uh, the value of what you do goes up, let's say a neurosurgeon, you need to be really good. If you are killing people, if your rate of success is less than average, you're gone, right? Same idea, maybe like a police officer, there's a lot of trust placed on them. Therefore, there's a high level of responsibility for these educators, there's a higher level of responsibility. I guess that's what I'm getting at. So my question for you guys, is that something that you've experienced amongst your peers where you've noticed that? Is that an issue? Why do you think that is? Why is there that separation between being knowledge, very domain specific, they know what they're talking about, but not being able to separate that kind of from turning into a guru, essentially? Mike, I'm going to let you tackle this first because I have many thoughts and I don't want to <laughs> Mike's like, rant. I just disagree, Omar, with what you said. <laughs> you know that, what? That's, that's actually not true. Yeah. You're not going <laughs> to paint our industry with this nasty brush. Uh, gotcha. Journalism has to stop, Omar. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I think that, uh, you know, most, well, I guess all of us are human, unfortunately. Um <laughs> And all of us are thus primates that display characteristics of primates in behavioral hierarchies. Um, and uh, dominance pattern behaviors uh, are very common and they feel completely natural and they are completely natural. As they're maybe not so great, but that naturalistic fallacy is uh, convenient there. So when people tell you that you're awesome, when you get a ton of attention for being awesome, when people come to a conference to hear you speak and they ask you what you think, it's only very natural to think that you're an authority figure and to think that you probably have it at least more figured out than the next guy, which is to say that you can be confident about what you're saying and say it as if it's very likely to be the truth. Um, and that, that little distance from very likely to is the truth is just the easiest step in the world to hop when the massive rush of your ego just pushes you over that thing. So, you know, if you're in a situation where, you know, you're in a panel and uh, it's you uh, and uh, you're just a smart guy and there's, you know, eight AI researchers and they're as smart as you or smarter, except they know their shit. And it's a panel about AI and someone asks you what you think about AI. You may have a semblance of humility that you never thought was possible. You're like, ah, I'm not really so sure, but I think this is what's going on. And everyone on the panel's like that. And you're like, but I could totally be wrong, <laughs> right? When you like people show up to see you speak and everything you say um, is just people are like, wow. Like I remember so like, well, my probably my first introdu introduction to somebody super intelligent was my dad who has a PhD in mathematical modeling from the Soviet Union. So can you imagine like if it's this shit just doesn't make any sense. Sense. And he always, um, in many conversations with regular folks, he would know uh, as much about uh, everything as they did, except he had a layer or two more. So they just thought he knew everything because they were like, well, clearly, like, there's nowhere for me to poke holes in this. And short of like their personal lives or like, you know, who's popular on the radio, he just knew everything else. So they would talk to him and they would have the sensation of, of being impacted by a guru. And they're like, oh my God, this man's fucking brilliant. And it's like, yeah, sure. Like, if you, but if you're that guy, and you go to conferences and you do webinars and you do Facebook Q&As and some 90, some percent of the time, you're, you, it's not that just you're correct about stuff or that's just you've won debates. You know what the person asking a question knows in three or four layers above that and you can put it into multiple contexts and then all of a sudden you feel real swell about how your analysis of the world is going and animal drive for egotistical thinking is, is, is around in all of us and if you don't actively check it or just have a really interesting personality type – um, that allows you to not be super egotistical. James Krieger is a good example. Uh, unless he's been through some kind of journey where he's muted his ego, it's, I would say it's a pretty good example of a person who's not super egotistical. But, you know, it's just it's just natural. So expect, you know, this is the kind of thing that people in, I think, every space are like this. Hilariously enough, you get this with folks that are known for being intellectually super you know, super advanced, like uh, some of the smartest people uh, will get into these bitter fucking little bullshit cockfights about, uh, uh, you know, 
Uh, and they're super obsessed with who's smarter. Uh, and, and it gets, it gets, it's, it's really funny because, you know, if you really, you were that smart and they are that smart, they just don't take the time to sort of quiet their mind and think like, okay, can I possibly be right about everything? Well, it's possible, but there's some probability that I'm not. So maybe if I could just be more scientifically accurate and present my ideas as, you know, uh, pretty confident conjectures, but I could definitely be wrong, that'd be great. Unfortunately, it also doesn't give the crowd exactly what they want. P there's a supply and demand issue there. People want a fucking guru. Man, I don't want to pay $300 for a conference on fucking nuance. I want $300 to be like, do this, don't do that. Here are the fucking answers. Like, I want revealed wisdom. And if someone can be smart enough and know enough about the subject more than me on every domain, and, and they, you know, they happen to speak very confidently and they also say, look, this is the way it is. And also they have scientists and a PhDs and stuff. Who am I as a consumer of this knowledge to be like, nah, I don't know. I mean, like, oh my God, it finally, finally, all this bullshit on bodybuilding.com. And I finally found the truth, the truth writ large. Uh, and it's very tempting. So I think it's, you know, everyone, your own ego wants you to be an authoritative person that makes no mistakes. And everyone who shows up and talks to you wants you to like, people like literally ask me questions on Instagram. They're like, Dr. Mike, why are you wearing socks today instead of shoes? What the fuck? Like, who gives a shit? First of all, second of all, I'm just some like barely functioning person that maybe forgot my shoes. It's probably 99 times out of a hundred why I'm squatting in socks. So it's like, but there's always, it's gotta be an insight because I can do no wrong. And I mean, this intellectual mm. monster that's clearly thought everything through. And you know, sometimes I have thought a lot of shit through, but sometimes not. People want you to be a guru. You want to yeah. be a guru. You're a guru. And it takes a lot of, quite frankly, unflattering resistance internally for yourself and a lot of work to not become that guru. So I want to answer your question directly. Why do we see people in the evidence-based community still guruisms? We get this fucking Godzilla of people who want you to be a guru. We got Mothra flying in, use your own ego. And then like you got this dumbass on a skyscraper waving like a resistance flag and that's your critical thinking abilities because you know they use them to be a good scientist. And Mothra's like, Boo! whatever the fuck he does, Godzilla does the atomic fire breath. And all of a sudden, boom, you're a fucking guru and you're the man. And, 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 and here's the thing, you say like, oh my God, like how could someone go so wrong? Where's the check and balance process? There's a fucking check and balance process. What check and, like if someone's like, Imagine someone was like perversely violent at home and, and then finally got out and he was violent with a waiter and they're like, oh my God, like turns out this guy's a bunch of accusations against him. Like, like uh, here's the check and balance in, in that is like eventually it'll go public. But like when everyone wants you to be a guru and you like being guru, where the fuck is the check and balance? You could go doing this for years or, or a decade or a lifetime and no one's ever going to be like, well, but nuance, like nobody cares about that guy. So unless you do it yourself, it's not happening. Yeah, I think that's a really good answer. And uh, I like that you focused on the the elements that are ubiquitous across all cultures, communities, and people. Because I, I think there are some specific things that go on in both the scientific community and then what I'll call the science communication community uh, and fitness especially um, that also feed into this and that have changed and basically acted as an accelerant as social media has evolved. And then I can also talk about some ways where we can actually inverse some of the things that are the problem to make them our safeguard. So I've, I've got some, I've thought a lot about this I um, <laughs> too much. <laughs> so I think the first thing I want to say is that people who are attracted to empirical rationalism are typically people who want there to be a clear answer. They, they like math, you know what I'm saying? Um, and the, while empiricism can get you the closest you can get to a quantitative big T truth, uh, there, there is really no actually getting to it. Um, and so you have these personalities who get into quantitative science who have, I would say, even more uh, aversion to the actual principles of the scientific method where it's based on probability, ranges, never having an absolute number, and making generalizations about the mean but not having answers for the individual person. Um, they don't they'll acknowledge that there's an art and science of coaching and sports science but if they had their druthers there would just be the science of coaching you know and i think that that's not like that's actually what i want that's what i morally believe that that's that's what how i think it should be but that's the way my brain would like it to be so that's kind of that's always the undercurrent that you're dealing with when you talk to scientists is that they want there to be a two plus two equals four not a two plus or minus 0.5 plus two plus or minus 0.5 equals four plus or minus 1.9 with a confidence interval from three to five. You know what I'm saying? So 
um, I think the very natural position of a scientist or someone in, involved in this is, is against kind of the way that we really need to be speaking and what's at the core philosophical underpinnings of what science is. Uh, so I think your average scientist is not doesn't really want the scientific method to be the way it is. Your average scientist wants to give you those simple answers. And then exactly like Mike said, you get asked to then follow the way your, your natural inclination is, uh, especially from the evidence-based crowd, because that's a bunch of people who've decided not to follow Mr. Olympia. They've decided to follow the Olympia of brains, and they believe, they want it to be true, that the smarter the person is, the more efficacious their methods are. And I've had the same exact thing as Mike. I recently had a message on Instagram where someone was like, hey, what's, what's your rationale behind having Bryce Lewis do curls? And I sent back, Bryce likes them. Like, there's no, I, I am not this grand mastermind who everything I do is, has some intricate, you know, uh, you know like, like black box algorithm you can never understand. And you have to come pray at the feet of, of my mighty intellect. Like, oh, the, I'm sure there's something that has to do with the tendon strength. So when he does a mixed grip, like, no, no. The dude came from bodybuilding background. He likes to do curls. And we're far away from comp. That's, the opportunity cost is nothing. And he's happy. He does curls, gets puppies, looks in the mirror. He's a happy man. Good, great. You know, that's it. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. Uh, what I talked about before, where we kind of came from the the general lifting community that is very kind of, <laughs> it's like, man, it's so embedded in the culture. Like we, we people sell products and put in their name alpha, like we're, we're like we're a pack of wolves, which is, you know, the, the most beta thing ever you can do is put alpha in your name. No offense to like 95% of people who are listening who are now mad at me. Sorry. But it's it's just ridiculous, like the idea that the goal of, of fitness is actually to be the head of the pack, you know. But that's that, like Mike said, that's kind of natural. It's part of it. So I think that that came first before there was this evidence based explosion. Uh, and then the last piece of it is that we're only now just coming out of the era where we were the the redheaded stepchild on the back foot defending ourselves as why we weren't as big or as successful or as strong. Or why were we the minority? Like, oh yeah, all these science guys. Like, none of them are big, none of them are jacked. They're only like it's it's like ninety five percent of us are doing it this way, five percent are doing it that way, and you guys look like shit, and we don't. Like, yeah, who's who's the smart guy now? That was basically the the, the standard position you'd be in any time you might have presented science that bucked the current norm. So I think that resulted in this very kind of back against the wall. I've got to be really, really good at eviscerating people intellectually uh, and making you look stupid and making me look smart because I'm already kind of starting below you and that it's I'm the only not... weapon I have. Yeah. Exactly. And, it's, and, and it becomes a weapon. And science shouldn't be a weapon because then no longer is it used in open debate where you're steel manning other people and the purpose is, is, is to learn and to have everyone come away with something closer to the truth. You're trying to, to get off the wall, fight and win. Um, so I think when science is used as a weapon by someone who has a natural inclination towards wanting there to be an absolute truth, and when you are then supported by everyone around you to give them an absolute truth, uh, and then it's accelerated by social media, uh, where things that are following that, 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 that equation and that pattern are liked, it gets you more followers and you're rewarded both financially and socially, it really, really does uh, encourage people to get worse over time. And I think we're starting to get away from that because a lot of the voices in the evidence-based community are not being science-based. They're truly being evidence-based and we're doing things. We're promoting rational skepticism and posts like Mike made are, I think, are a fantastic example of that. Um, the advice I would give, one thing we can do is use our egos and use our, our, our self-identities uh, in that way. So, for example, anyone who knows me knows the easiest way to actually like truly piss me off and, and, and make me mad in reality and get around my defenses of being online and having to have a shield up to so say you and can't I really, dance. really shouldn't. Correct. That's it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's to basically attack my integrity um, because a huge part of my self-esteem, my ego, and what is built on me seeing myself as someone who uh, is, 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 a, is a worthwhile human being for being alive is that I will do what I think is right I will adhere to the scientific principle. So rational skepticism and integrity related to that. So intellectual integrity, intellectual honesty is, is, is kind of how I value myself. So in my own head, 
my hierarchy, my ego feeds on a lot of things. Of course, I'm a complex human. I'm an athlete. There's like being the biggest and the strongest. That's important still too. But one of the major things is, is do I hold myself to the highest standard of intellectual honesty? And I want people to see me as intellectually honest. I want people to see me like when, like when people say, oh, he's Captain America, part of me really likes that. Not because Chris Evans has a great body, but because Cap Captain America is like the embodiment of, of having integrity. So like, and that's something that I that clicked on in my head. Like, why do I like being called Captain America? It's not just like, like, and I try not to feed into it too much because I think it's important to be aware of those things, even when they do feed positive behaviors. But yeah, so I think if, if you can bake into your own ego, if you can bake into your own motivation and your self-identity, rational skepticism, then like if, 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 the, if you get hyped up and if your, your ego is fed by doing things that actively attack your ego, you can kind of invert it. And that's the people I've seen who are relatively successful in not losing that. Uh, their value system is based on intellectual honesty. So that even if their ego is fed, it doesn't derail them a totally different direction. It might be something else. But if your ego is fed by being the, the man or being right, that's where uh, you get off course and you don't even know it because you're still engaging with science. You're still engaging with people. You're still debating. Um, you're, you're doing the science thing all day. It might even feed you to look at science more voraciously because you because you have this strong kind of destructive need to be the shit, you know, uh, while the other one is going to make you think more and, and reflect and read other people's stuff and be humble and, and not just keep not just piling page upon page of your own suppositions because you bought into your own. Uh, you know, your own hype or your own hypotheses. Um, but that that's another funny thing you'll look at is when someone gets, like, for example, Charles Poliquin, I'll use as another example. He's actually the first person to publish a peer-reviewed scientific article about daily undulating periodization. Just sit on that for a second. And then 20 years later, he was the guy who you can ask at a conference, hey, what movement do you think is best for X type of performance? And he'll sit there, look up, and then tell you, I think power cleans and probably give you about, I don't know, 80% benefit. And it's just completely shit pulled out of his butt because at a certain point, he became so convinced that he had all the answers that he believed if something just comes out of me because of my experience and who I am and everything, it's probably right. So if I say something with no evidence, it has evidence because I'm evidence, you know? Uh, and that's where you don't want to get to. And I think. Um, having those checks and balances where you actually use your ego to prevent your ego from eliminating your checks and balances is, is a really important strategy and something that I've actually started to do consciously as I've become aware of people who I used to really idolize who have gotten so far off um, in, in what I think is a key essential component of being an educator. That's brilliant, man. I, one of my checks and balances, I, I really just desperately don't enjoy being wrong. I don't like to be wrong. And I realized that if I uh, hold on to hypotheses that have been disproven, I'm just going to be wrong, really wrong. And the longer I hold on to them, the more wrong I am, both by duration and potentially magnitude as that hypothesis drifts <laughs> further away from the truth. So, uh, you know, if you really just don't like being wrong, you have to have a really solid open-mindedness about the evidence because you don't want to put your foot in the, the, the lava of the wrong pile and you want to re just real tentatively, just gently put your foot in the probably correct area, but just real tentatively. You don't want to ever really step firmly in anything because it could turn into your wrong magma and suck you up. So I think it's good to, if you don't, if, so a lot of it, like you said, you can use your own ego sort of to help you here. A lot of the people that are arguing super egotistically for one position or another because you can tell they desperately don't want to be wrong. Mm. Um, it's a tough situation when you already started arguing for something is then you sort of put your, your coins behind it. But if you're coming to something anew, which you can do every day or every minute if you'd like, then you can say, okay, so if I really didn't want to be wrong, how would I approach this? And say, well, you know, I think these things are reasonable. Like these are my best guesses at how the world works, but I'm super open to interpretation. Um, one of those things recently that comes to, to mind is like the effect of reps concept, which has been doing mm -hmm. its good, good share of floating around. And it's always like one of my favorite people in the industry is Menno Henselman's because he's like an iconoclast by nature. So he just like whatever people are saying, Menno's just going to say some other shit. And you're like, God damn it, he's too smart for me to write him off. 
and you start reading a shit and you're like, fuck, like, I don't agree with everything he says. He's got some good fucking points. So when Meadow yeah. disagrees with something, I'm like, all right, time to read Meadow shit. So, you know, the effect of raps, it's again one of these uh, uh, Thomas Sowell quote shibboleths where people are like, this is it. This is just it. That's it. All you got to do is count effective reps and you're fucking golden. And then you look at it more nuanced way and you're like, you know, this is a fucking wildly applicable, super useful concept that is not holistic and doesn't take everything into account and is a big part of, of picture that has other stuff in it. And then all of a sudden, yeah. if you don't, if you really just don't want to be wrong, you see, what do you think about effective reps? Like, I think it's, it's a great concept. But, uh, you know, there's some ways to apply it that results in mild oversimplification, sometimes moderate to severe oversimplification. And then you're just not getting as jacked as you could be. And but there, it's not something like, like effective reps is fucking stupid. Like, no, it's not stupid. It's really awesome. It just has to be put in context. So if you always approach problems with, ooh, I just I, I hope I'm not wrong about this. It's going to keep you uh, probably have a high degree of humility and saying, OK, if I really don't want to be wrong, I really don't want to overcommit to anything. I have to be more open minded. I have to couch my statements probabilistically because look, if you do enough probabilistic couching, it's very difficult to be wrong on a technical basis. Like someone's like, oh, it turns out MRV is wrong. Was it? Well, I never said MRV was for sure true. I just said it was, was my best interpretation at the time. And you can survive massive hits to your sort of intellectual credibility over the years and just, uh, you know, you could say, hey, look, like I didn't, you know, I used to think this was true, but uh, my opinions on it have, have changed and now I'm probably more correct. So if you used to follow me for some shit you thought was true and now you don't because I was wrong, now's your time to really follow me because I'm more right now than I was back then. And I might fuck up again, but you'll know that I'll be the first person to scoop that up. Like for me, I mean, I was probably wrong about delayed onset muscle soreness to a significant extent early in my non-social media uh, understandings during that time of my life, to a moderate extent in my early social media career, to a small extent more recently, and now I think I probably have it more or less figured out, but I could be fucking still wrong. Um, and, and that's one of those things that, um, you know, uh, a lot of people just won't, you know, mostly the, for some reason, the evidence based people just all hate delayed onset soreness and think it doesn't either doesn't mean anything or is always terrible. But, um, you know, for the bros have gone down with that ship. They're like, you have to get debilitatingly sore or else you're not doing anything. That's just probably wrong. And then on the other hand, like you have like an example of, um, you know, uh, where like people used to say that you, you had to cut you had to keep your intensity as high as possible when you were cutting and you, you the, the volume didn't do shit and you just had to be lift as heavy as you can all the way into a cut because that's what preserves muscle. And I saw numerous people in the evidence-based world maybe five years ago, like almost everyone was on that bus. And Eric, you were one of the first people to be like, eh, is that really true? And you kind of stepped off. And then a bunch of people seriously just crashed with that ship. And that, that debate, as far as I'm concerned, is not over, but it's like, you know, it's pretty clear volume is probably more significant driving factor or all else being equal than intensity for muscle retention on a, a fat loss phase. It's also how almost every bodybuilder trains. And, and then all of a sudden you're like, man, I, you know, it's probably not true that it works this way, but there are some people who are like, no, it has to be this way. And they um, actually, one of these gentlemen uh, messaged me and claimed to me that he has never been wrong in his 20 some years of commentary and he doesn't plan mm -hmm. it and he's survived all of us. And he'll survive me too. Um, and uh, that was like, wow, that's fucking sweet, man. I, I really wish I could go through a whole career and never be wrong. Um, and it was just, it's one of those things where you're like, not, not sure what to say after that. Yeah. When someone, someone, someone literally tells you I've never been wrong and in a private message, not like, yeah. not like just public social cred. That's, that, that's, that's, that's problematic. I, I wonder, I wonder what the thinking behind was like the social engineering aspect was he, he sent me that he probably, like his, his ideal version of, is me reading that email and going, fuck, oh shit, I thought this guy's been wrong before. Oh my God, I, I can never win this. I just better retract all my opinions right now. Just like, I don't know, go hide or some shit. Yeah, I, I also don't know that there's necessarily always planning and thought going into those statements when the ego is driving the bus. You know, sometimes Usually it's just... not, probably. Yeah, I would guess not. But uh, I, I really like what you said there. I um, The... I think it's indicative. There's a lot of people, and I understand it from a consumer standpoint, you want to follow the, the, the people who are correct most of the time, right? Like, you are not you don't go to a mechanic to be like, you know what, I know you're going to jack my car up, but you're the type of mechanic who I know in five years would fix my car better than today, you know? <laughs> so so I, I get it from the consumer standpoint that they're going to seek out probably who they think is the most correct, but... It's actually very difficult to assess that. If if you could assess uh, who had the most correct opinions about cutting edge exercise science, 
uh, you wouldn't need to follow anybody. Um, the only thing you really can assess is, uh, regardless of your content area expertise individually, is whether or not someone displays the characteristics of rational skepticism. Yes. Yes. And then you have to ask yourself, well, do I believe that rational skepticism is the way to get the closest to the truth? And that's really the question I want every consumer to ask themselves. Because in that, that's the situation where if you saw someone, even who you respected, even who's been right a lot, say, I have never been wrong, that's the few instances where you go, all right, I'm out. You yeah. know, like this This isn't someone, like maybe, sure, still follow them, still read what they have to say, but... Yes. Um, but but it's it's definitely an example where you know that they have a blind spot that is truly blind yeah. and quite large. I, I, I will say something on that note. Um, if the ultimate thing to do as a rational skeptic, when someone has proven themselves to not be a rational skeptic, and this is a total mind fuck, is you apply the same rubric to them as you do everyone else. So we, we, you have a guy who's a rational skeptic and he says, blah, blah, blah. And people say, what do you think about that guy? What he's saying? You're like, hmm, I find it very interesting and I'm going to give it some thought. And I'm going to compare it to my own experience and evidence and I'm going to give you an, a, a response. And then someone who's known to be a guru says, blah, blah, blah. And people are like, what is that guy saying? What do you think of that guy? Guy's an idiot, right? He's not a fucking scientist. You're like, I'm going to look at them and I'm going to well, try to figure out what they're saying. And if they're, if they're right, they're right. The truth doesn't be, is not modified based on who's saying it. Like, you know, like electrons, you know, are negative and protons are positive. Electrons are negative, protons are positive. Like, which would Hitler could say one of these and you'd be like, well, fucking Hitler, hate him. Uh, he's got, you know, he's right. <laughs> so it's one of these things where you, once you understand that the only way to treat the entire world is to rational skepticism, you don't even have to like uh, couch your opinions about anyone's. Like, so like if, uh, you know, food babe or something said some stuff, uh, you know, on my, if you catch me on my worst day, I'm like, where the fuck is she? It's time to get violent. Right. But on my best day, I, I would say, you know, it's an interesting claim she's making. I wonder if it's true. Cause you know, even like fucking broken clock is right twice a day and food babe mm -hmm. can you'd be like right about some shit. I'm sure. I'm sure someone's found something she said that's correct. So I, I will say that there's a, another sort of level to this where, uh, insofar as you're, especially as a non-professional in sports science, exercise science, insofar as your bandwidth for consuming knowledge uh, is limited, um, people that have consistently proven themselves to be guruistic and also wrong a lot, uh, probably people that you should just sort of in like a Buddhist sense be open-minded to and, and include um, and not hate. But in a practical sense, you'd be like, like how many articles by Guru McCoach did you read this week? Like, well, I was busy reading Eric Helms and Omar Asuf articles. So like I might get to one of those later, but insofar as my window of consumption is finite, I'm going to stick mostly people who probably aren't crazy into that window, not to say that that person couldn't be correct. So we don't want to write people off, but <clears throat> – Right. In, insofar as we can structure a higher, like a, you know, like a sort of hierarchy of individuals or like a pecking order of most likely to be correct slash most rational, you know, because your consumption is finite in any case, actually, you should probably figure out, you know, what the top end of that cluster is and focus most of your efforts on that. Though I think you should, for intellectual diversity's sake, poke around at the bottom of the pile too, because there's some good shit down there. And of course, with groupthink um, and other phenomena variables like that. A lot of people uh, at the very top of the heap can be wrong and wrong in concert and in unison. And then you're really like, oh, fuck. Like, you know, you guys remember, Eric, I'm sure you remember this. Um, the whole like IFYM is the only fucking thing. And if you talk about foods being like better or worse, you're just totally out to lunch. And not only that, you're promoting eating disorders and you're crazy. Like back in the day, if you looked at what the top five people in the industry were saying about that in the evidence-based community, you were just going to be like, all right, I'm literally going to get an IFYM tattoo on my forehead right next to my swastika. And I'm going to go like out and proselytize. <laughs> <laughs> Right. It, it, but like you would have felt a little silly a couple of years later when people were like, you know what? It turns out IFOM is great, but it has the following limitations. And it turns out that you can actually rank order foods unhealthiest to least healthy for the average Western diet. And there's some meaning to that. Some meaning to that. It's not it's not yeah. all encompassing. Right. So there's I think the difference it's, between processed and unprocessed foods. And guess what? Right. IFYM can definitely coexist with eating disorders. For sure. For sure. <laughs> right. For sure. Whoa, whoa. You guys mean the Instagram accounts that try and show how you could fit every single dessert into your macros are not oh okay okay yeah just, yeah but yeah. you know honestly to continue the theme of this discussion 
they're fucking swell if that's what you're looking for, you know? Just don't look mm. at it religiously and be like, I have to cram a Snickers bar up my ass when I'm dieting, <laughs> which, by the way, feels great. Uh, unless you like, sometimes the nuts aren't the round ones, they're the pokey ones. And you gotta go for the two pack, not the single pack, Mike. Whoa, Trust me damn, on that one. king size. Yeah, king size. Funny. You yeah, try to you slam get... a Twix up there. Oh, Kit Kat, because it's three uh, bars. Oh, well, Kit, Kit, Kit Kats has Pro progressive Pro. overload built into it. You can do one, two, three, or like, four. How many Kit Kat bars are you doing right now? Or like, I don't, I'm on a diet. Like, I'm shoving up your ass. Like, yeah, not, 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 can not I taste that chocolate way. like that? <laughs> like, no, I actually don't know why I'm doing this. Funny um, enough, sorry, real quick. Yeah. Apparently, it used to be a thing. It might still be a thing. Um, individuals in our, in our fine university Greek system figured out that if you – pour alcohol or put it on a tampon and insert it rectally that you can still absorb a, actually a vast quantity of it and okay. with no uh, bad taste effects or GI effects you can get violently drunk very quickly and uh, begin to assault others and yourself emotionally um, and it turns out it's super easy to, to go overboard with it because you don't feel a thing until you're super drunk so anyway is it Friday yet fellas hey <laughs> So we got, so we got something that going. for everyone. This podcast has something for everyone. Yeah. Yep. Our tangents always pay off. If you're the uh, the super secret quick uh, drunk who is not rectally intimidated, you <laughs> you just got the tidbit. So for that point, one percent like, of the Iron Culture <laughs> podcast followers, you're welcome. Someone's like, "Hey, I want a party." You're like, "Ooh, okay." Are you rectally intimidated? They're like, "I don't know what that means." Like, you'll love I it. have this a four crazy. part questionnaire to decide how you want to party. It's a logic tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if then statement tree to get you towards putting something in your butt. So something you know, I, I think. Go ahead, Omar. Oh, Coach, do you want to do you want to go first? No. Oh, I don't. oh, see, see what he's doing, Mike. He's trying to do that shit where he's like, it's like, oh, go ahead. Oh, here's disgusting. my shield, Captain America. Just, We're tired of shit. It sounds We're like I'm being inclusive, shit. but it's really just <laughs> passive aggressive. Yeah. No, yeah. I uh, something I wanted uh, to ask. Both of you guys seeing once again the industry and being in it longer than myself, kind of as people try and percolate up, let's say, and I spoke with this previously. I think Eric just maybe in a private chat how humans and ways we crave complexity, understanding over time, hopefully, right, in, in a variety of different ways, that the path that I kind of saw or the path maybe I experienced would first be people would turn to whoever would be largest in the room where they want to try and follow the person that has the clear in quotations evidence evidence of proof of concept look at me i'm jacked it's kind of the first stance of where people gravitate towards and that's still when we see fitness because it is a physical uh manifestation of what you're doing you see the outward appearance so it's not just theoretical we actually see what's going on people are like oh yeah he's jacked want to follow him cool that's like the first layer and then people have a natural proclivity, perhaps, towards following someone. So someone, as you said, Mike, is right is right uh, pretty often. So it's like, you know what? I'm going to start following this person, not their line of thinking or creating our own way of seeing the world. But this person, yeah, I understand that genetics play a factor when it comes to getting jacked. So just following the person that's most jacked is probably not the best idea. Okay, who's right, right? Because as you said, and I think that was very astute, Mike, and I found myself actually when it comes to my content thinking about this, that there's only a finite amount of consumption any individual can make. And the line or the thought that I have in my head is essentially not to crowd things out. If there's a thousand voices, the job of each creator should be, is this useful? Am I actually contributing something? Or is this actually just for my ego where I want to participate? Why I think about this as a musician a little bit when it comes to music is like there's a lot of people yelling and screaming. There's not a lot of people creating music. And sometimes, unfortunately, due to humans, their sorting mechanisms, we could be doing a disadvantage to those that are better than us by taking up a potential space that other people can where just whatever, due to likability, presentation, whatever, someone will choose you versus someone else that has better information. And for the most part, I would say when it comes to early YouTube, I saw that where it was kind of how you looked, how you presented, not what you said. And there was kind of that big debate long ago, not worth getting into, between the Hodge twins and Ian McCarthy. And that's that, that's a whole thing to unpack. But essentially, people go from most jacked to then the second level, which would be, I want to follow who's right. I want to know who's right, right? And so it's kind of that guru level. And then as they kind of continue to percolate up, they go from a guru to another guru. It's like, well, this person's actually, oh, you know what, man, as you said, uh, IFYM or 
Right, right. Where you start evaluating, they're kind of like baseball cards. It's like, well, his battle system, like he's improving over time. I'm going to choose him. And so you percolate up through the gurus. My question for both of you, observing the industry as a whole, I think the overall fitness IQ has gone up. But how do you assist or how for the listeners do they go from whatever process we start out, which is down here, guys jacked, I want to follow him, to kind of the guru a worship towards developing our own set of critical thinking, kind of Daniel Kaiman, uh, thinking fast and slow, rational skepticism. How do we accelerate that process so that we are not only most correct, but we're benefiting ourselves when we try and learn about this information? Because you guys have gone through the process. You've seen this now longer than myself. It's a process that I have try to be a part of on my own journey. And I look back at some of my content years ago and I laugh and it's great. Um, so what is your advice then now that we're all just laying down our humble cards on the table for those listening, what, how do we accelerate that process? How do, how do we uh, try and be on the path that's the most correct? From the perspective of the consumer, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or the listener uh, now. Yeah. Right. Um, I think for, there's a couple things. So that, like the characteristics I would be looking for in someone if I was going to be like, all right, should I invest time? Because like you said, it's an opportunity cost and in, in, into into consuming this person's information. Um, I think I think you want to find people who are very principle-based and who spend some amount of their time teaching you how to think, uh, who spend some amount of time actually talking about some of these concepts. Maybe not in like, here, here are the logical fallacies, but more so teaching you how to think in the context of uh, the information you're interested in in, 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 in taking on board. Um, and I think you also want to have a look at their specific credentials. And when I say specific credentials, I mean, what are you looking for? Like, are you looking for a coach or are you looking for some pretty good generalizable programs that you could jump on? Or are you looking to understand the exercise science? So those are different people. I think that's one thing we aren't very good at in evidence-based community is there was a time point where we thought good coach equals most right science. And by, by that metric, every coach 10 years ago was trash. But that's completely false. You know, coaching is about relationships and communication. And the methods you use is science. Um, and that can improve, but a shitty coach with good science is not going to do well just like a really good coach with say 1800 science is probably going to make some some errors although they probably make less than you'd think because their good coach involves you know changing when you see things happen so anyway i think for example if, if you want to find someone who can get you really good applicable information they should to some degree be walking the walk themselves they don't need to be the biggest or the strongest or anything like that but they need to be successfully progressing towards relative to, to where they were so you know they're actually trying these things and are successful. Uh, you probably want to see them having some degree of client success. They don't need to be coaching world champions or anything like that, but they have actually, they're in the field and they're trying this out with multiple different demographics and not just sharing their like most awesome people. Uh, they want to show that they have science uh, literacy and they can reason their way through things. Uh, and then they, most importantly, is they're displaying the characteristics of a rational skeptic and then also putting a ladder down to help you climb up I think that's really important so that you're not just going to jettison them when you find out they're wrong about something because you have that guru mentality. Uh, I think that 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 is long, so long as you have the guru mentality, you're going to end up jettisoning a whole lot of rational skeptics because they will openly say, I was wrong about this or I changed my mind or I'm not confident here when you want them to put a, put their, their foot down and have a firm position and speak from a place of authority and confidence. So I think... Um, all of those factors need to be there. And some of that does actually put some onus on the consumer. I think until they get to that point where they're aware of some of those ethos that we're talking about, it's going to be difficult to find the right person. They're going to be kind of be kicked around the, uh, the pinball machine, if you will, of, of different purveyors of bad science with different types of archetypes. Damn. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really good stuff. Um, I agree with all of that, and I would be adding a considerable amount of redundancy if I repeated all of it, which I could, and it would be my words as well. I will say that an interesting way to figure out, um, or to add, add credence or subtract it from someone who you think is a rational skeptic, is to see how they handle criticism or questions. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's been really instructive. So, for example, uh, I actually have a very well, there's almost all the stuff Eric said and a couple other things. I have a very well thought out selection mechanism for people that I follow because I'm very intellectually curious about a bunch of other fields. Like I do most of my pleasure reading is economics, environmental science, uh, artificial intelligence and shit like that. You know, no friends, right? So I have to select people from these fields who I would sort of estimate are probably more correct than not and also are on their path to being more correct rather than the path of defending shibboleths that have been extinct for years. And um, uh, to me, you know, a lot of people that stand out as intellectually very superior are people that have address critiques in just a phenomenal way, um, you know, like charitably saying, hey, like I see where this person's coming from and, you know, that are not wrong about this, this and that. But on these specific points, I have the view of blah, blah, blah. And you're like, holy shit, if this person listens to criticism and they don't think themselves superior in, in a way that means they just don't care about what someone says, like you're a fucking idiot, I'm right. Um, one, um, uh, one of my uh, folks that I look to as an expert in environmental science, which is unfortunately a field that is much worse off than ours, uh, in environmental science, a lot of the people that get into it, uh, commit research careers to it, is because they have a particular slanted view of the world, um, that the world is constantly getting worse, the environment's constantly degrading, that humans are the number one cause, and uh, sometimes the only cause, and that we need radical, uprooted social change now to stop environmental chaos. So you end up with an industry or a field or maybe something like 90% of the people are ideologically biased in one specific way, which is like a rough start for a field. So one of the guys that I look into this, his name is Bjorn Lomborg, and he actually, the way he got into environmental science was he was just a, st a statistics professor at a university in Denmark. He had one of his uh, master students, I think, uh, analyze uh, like uh, claims about environments either improving or degrading or like resource consumption improving or degrading. And he thought for sure that there was going to be degrading because he had bought the whole thing, but everything's getting worse all the time. And then his master student finished the project, brought it back, and he's like, eh, shit's getting better. And he's like, what? Get the fuck out of here. So they looked at it more deeply, and he was like, ha, huh, okay. And they started looking at it more deeply, and it turns out there had been a lot of basically misinformation. And, and I had followed, started following this guy when he wrote his book called The Skeptical Environmentalist, which I recommend to everyone. It's mildly outdated now, just not as much recency, but the main thrust of the book is really good. So I was following, 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 and then he was basically saying the global warming is, is highly overrated. Uh, we don't have to get into now why that is the case, but I believe it is very much the case. Uh, so he believes that it's anthropogenic or is caused by humans. There's no much to, not much debate about that. So I was like, okay, so this guy's not a global warming denier, nutsoid guy who's like Republican oil money hat, <laughs> like. Like, you know, like, so he's clearly, and also he's, you know, like he's gay and from Denmark and a professor. There's only so right wing you can be. <laughs> There's so many Venn diagrams you can draw. <laughs> like, and then he was, uh, you know, on this sort of like, basically, he was going up against people intellectually that were like, you know, global warming is going to fucking happen tomorrow. It's going to just tidal wave, Al Gore, like, tidal wave is going to kill us all, like, tonight. Then he was saying, like, look, it's it's actually just very slow, et cetera. And then he did a revision of the literature where he published in a fucking book that he published that he was actually significantly wrong about global warming. And it was worse than he thought. Who the fuck does that? And I was like, oh, my God. But then, of course, like he took his uh, like his economic style thinking to that. He was like, OK, so the IPCC climate change models, I thought they predicted this. Turns out they predict that. But everyone else is predicting that, right? So all of his general stuff still applies, but maybe we need to invest more in alternative resource technologies and sort of do a cap and trade system, et cetera, et cetera. And, and here's another thing. All of his recommendations were nuanced and viewed cost versus benefits. Like uh, I actually got into it got into debate. These people asked for it. You know, people hanging out leaflets in the streets in major cities, like support this and that. <laughs> so one of those people so was you, like, you wasted a Thursday afternoon. It was what, great. What it was like, fine. It was really very short. I was with Nick Shaw at the time. This was pre RP. And, um, this person was like, Hey, like, you know, stop global warming. And I was like, Oh, cool. So I had read the skeptical environmentalist and a bunch of other stuff. And I was like, okay, so what is the cost of stopping global warming. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, it's like uh, any programs you impose to stop emissions, et cetera, they have a monetary cost. And if you look at the Kyoto Protocol, it's fucking, tr it's like a zillion dollars, okay? And they were like, well, it's probably gonna be a lot, but it's worth it. I'm like, oh, okay. And what is the cost of like just doing nothing about global warming? Like in 2000, 2100, what if we did nothing? What's the environmental cost? Like how many people's houses get swept over? How many fucking animals die? How much does our earth get hotter and fuck up agriculture? How many people die of infectious disease? And he was just like, 
I don't, that's not, that's beside the point. And I was like, that's the only fucking point. What? So it was like, this person had no idea of cost versus benefits, just never entered his mind. So if I was going to follow Mr. Leaflet guy, that right there is his failed test. Like, eh, no thanks. Like, uh, open to your ideas, but maybe not so much. Jordan Lomberg, on the other hand, the skeptical environmentalist author, always couched things in, well, here's the cost of doing however much about global warming, here are the benefits, and here's the cost of doing nothing. Just as a reference frame, we need to pick a policy that does a good job at curbing global warming, but not at, like in, uh, that wastes so much money that we have people dying of treatable diseases in our beds because we've shuttled our entire economy into preventing an inordinate amount of global warming that maybe it's not even that bad. You know, that, again, like back to the article about... Um, critical thinking, some bad things have benefits. Like, did you guys know that global warming actually causes like a decrease in cold deaths like all the time? <laughs> and you know, way more people die of cold deaths than heat deaths. It's like shit you would just never know. And it sounds like, like oh yeah, you listen to this episode, like Dr. Mike is a fucking conspiracy theorist, wacko, he's anti-global warming. Global warming is absolutely caused by humans, or almost certainly, right? Got to keep the thread, right? And then, um, you know, but there is a nuance there that has to be explored. And the way that Bjorn Lomborg came out and was like, hey, look, I was wrong by like a big margin. Here's how I think about it now. I, and he's done that numerous times and he always reconstructs his view. And you can tell he's coming from a place that he just wants to be correct. And when you see people saying, because there's a huge anti Bjorn Lomborg sentiment of people who are just vitriolically like environmentalist, period. Like that's all, that's my identity. And any question to that is evil. There's people just don't even know what to do with them. Like there's a, if you want to see a really garbage fucking website, go to a place called Rational Wiki, which is already, like if he has rational in the name, you have to wonder why they have to say that. Their entry on Bjorn Lomborg is like, he's a piece of shit, cocksucker, retard. You're like, okay, these people are really thinking. And it's just one of these things where, if you can respond to criticism super well, if you're super open-minded, if you revise your opinions about things, a lot of people, when you revise your opinions, say that that's your falling from grace. I say that's your ascension to grace because clearly you just want to be correct all the time. Or you could just go go down with the ship. And I think that, you know, on top of everything else Eric said, if you have an individual who you want to follow that's maybe not, I don't know, humble is the term, but reconsiders their views. Uh, Brad Schoenfeld's a perfect example in our industry. Brad Schoenfeld is funny because he was like pro low volume and then he did a bunch of studies that were like, you're wrong. And he's like, fuck. And then he was a pro high frequency and he did a bunch of studies that that's not true. And he's like, God damn it. So he revised his views all the time. And when you ask him a question, he's like, well, it seems to be that. And you're like, man, like if this guy's going to be wrong, he's probably just not going to be wrong for very long. That's how you follow these people is you see the way they talk, you see the way they act and they exhibit that worldview of uh, of skepticism and rationality where they can't be wrong for too long because they're always open to reinterpretation and there's evidence of that fact. Because, Omar, are you committing crimes recently? What the fuck's going Look, on? Look, all I got to say is we got 10 more minutes on this podcast, Mike. You know, before I, you'll never see me again. For sure. No, and by, and by, by we, meaning uh, you and I can continue, Mike, and we'll just yeah, so have to Omar bail just gets, out Omar. Like, just extracted yeah. by the police right on camera. Like, we're still rolling, right? <laughs> so anyway, as I was saying. But yeah, so like, you know, when you're looking for folks to follow, um, it's easy for folks to say I'm evidence-based. It's easy for folks to say I'm open-minded. But with them actually being open-minded, that's a super cool thing. Like, you know, you 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 look at like um, – I had a, a bunch of conversations with Greg Knuckles where we're in like this fierce debate – on a message thread and I like finally make my grand overture. And he's like, Hmm, that might be, that might be a good point. And I'm like, God damn it. So now like <laughs> I've given him, he's like the Borg. I've given him my best weapon and he just turned it around. He was like, <laughs> right. And I'm like, no, you were supposed to grovel. Right. And I've done that to a shitload of people all the time. And they're like, this is feeling of emptiness. Like I was supposed to win something, but the whole point's not to win. It's to be right. And not to be wrong. If you want to win debates, just hang out with little kids. You can win as many debates as you want, hopefully. Uh, but if you want to hang out with adults and make good choices, then you kind of want to be right a lot. And you have to be super open-minded and uh, asserting what you think is probably the truth, but at the same time admitting that maybe you're not uh, have uh, some shit figured out. Yeah, I, I think uh, just to give you you some credit too, there, I think you're you're a good example of someone who who does that. Um, like there was a period, maybe I'd say two years ago, where every podcast wanted to try to get us together and have like Godzilla or, fight Mothra. You really yeah. let people down. That. Yeah, we did. And I think part of the reason is, is that every time we would get in a situation where we would have one of these concentrated discussions about that, is our opinions would both shift towards something that was a little more uh, influenced by the other. Um, like, I, I don't want to take credit for this, but like you, you mentioned how MRV, your, your, your opinions have changed on that. Like, 
there was a point when you were like, yeah, MRV is where you should be training. And now it's like, well, hey, there's an MEV, there's an MA, MAV, there's an MRV, and we should be cycling through that. You should take credit for that. My debate with you on Jeff Nipper's channel was what focused my efforts on rethinking the principles and uh, adding in the understanding of MEV. Uh, I don't even know where maintenance volume came from. That was sort of obvious. That MEV and a maximum adaptive volume, that was from that uh, podcast that we did like that's what started the thread of me shifting it so it was it was a wonderful thing you, it, you can take credit for that right sweet my ego's fed i am now the smartest and, I, um, I will uh cite so MEV i won as, is what we as got like tonight. mav register trademark of eric helms and i like that yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll work out the payment scheme for every time you say it um get that with ascap or something but the uh yeah so i i just was I remember when, when I first got exposed to your stuff, I wasn't like, oh, this guy's an idiot. That's hopefully not how I operate most of the time. But I was like, I, you know, there's some things I disagree with about this guy. But then over time, I just became really, really impressed because when I interacted with you, um, you were just very open and you have, have proven yourself to, I think, have become more right over time. I mean, you set a very low bar to start. Don't get me wrong. Lost. But, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Like. But um, but it's I, it's been very encouraging, and that's why I think Omar and I wanted to have you on to talk about this because I've seen your thoughts on, you know, rate of weight gain evolve on the, how to theoretically think about volume, um, on the the role of muscle damage and the mechanisms of hypertrophy, um, on you know periodization. That I, I've seen on autoregulation. I, I've seen your your views become more nuanced, and I think fortunately, if people are consuming sports science and fitness information it's nowhere near to the complexity of something like environmental science or AI. Um, and you still can get a relatively straightforward answers. I think the challenge for us as science communicators is to provide that nuance without providing unnecessary complexity or over caveating. You know, I think there's a certain, like, obviously you need to state when you're stating an anecdote or when you're setting a study like that, that's important, right? and not mix them within the same sentence or something like that. Or you need to, um, you know, ensure that you're not speaking in black and white terms. But I think the challenge and what I always try to do is to provide all of that nuance while still giving a relatively simple message. And I think fortunately, you know, lift weights and eat protein and be in a surplus if you want to gain weight and don't if you're trying to lose weight is relatively simple most of the time. Um, but but those, you can gain those... a deficit, Eric, you're wrong. You can gain muscle in a deficit in certain should. circumstances. Should can and should easy words to replace. <laughs> yeah, or, or I don't even think we should have both. We just need to revise our language so that they're the same word. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah, yeah. So, but but yeah, no, I, I think. Thanks for um, the props, man. It means a lot. Um, I will I give them some props back to you. When when uh, I first started writing stuff, 3DMJ was it. You know, like you guys were the sort of kings of the evidence based industry, and you could have let that go to your heads and been like, "We're just right about everything." But I've seen you and the folks over there, uh, you know, admit, like, stop practicing things that may not be correct. Uh, and, uh, you know, that there's more nuance and so on and so forth. One thing is I was very impressed by is actually, I don't know, I was impressed. I have a, a standard of behavior for you, Eric, that's very high already. So I was more like uh, just pleased, uh, expectantly pleased um, at, how, at how, you, uh, how you conducted yourself with the debate with uh, uh, Menno uh, Henselman's about diet breaks. Where, you know, Meta had some good fucking points where he was like, for mm. most regular people, diet breaks are dumb as shit. And you're like, yep, yep, yep. For, for competitors, they might have some advantages. And he's like, but they also have disadvantages. Like, yep, you're totally right. And I was like, God damn, that was like a fucking stick and move. And bah -bah. it was like amazing. But like what came out of that was like, I learned a bunch from that fucking podcast. And I was like, God damn, like. Like it's so important to have both the menos of this world that are sort of incisive in their like criticism, like this, 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 this can't be right. And then folks like yourself that are like, you know, let's agglomerate all this together, properly couch it so that we can say, okay, like this may have some advantages. It may have some downsides. So like it really, uh, it really insults the question of like the Instagram style question from like, you know, dildo incel 49 with zero posts. 
that's like that's just diet breaks question mark and you're like god yes. damn it why can't you just die in a fire <laughs> die anyway i don't even fire is not a requisite but it's just one of those things where it's like diet breaks it's like well you know like if you if you got a show coming up and it's another six weeks and you're at the end of your rope yes if you're doing an eight-week diet to get in shape for the summer for the love of god don't take three diet breaks during that shit yeah but, like do you want to do a seven-week diet instead yeah, i guess yeah yeah to, to, your, to your point really quick about saying like you know we, we can't over overly new to, to the point of saying nothing, I think there's an art, maybe a science, to uh, quantify or qualifying statements the least amount possible to, to, to simultaneously have a very contracted statement length, or concise, mm. but also to make sure that everything in that statement is technically correct and not impeding on some kind of boundary or another. Uh, I think I'm yeah, like pretty really decent well at that sort of thing, but like it's always a refined skill because you always want to answer in a way that is going to convey value without citing 50 different papers in a fucking study. But also you want to answer in a way that's not like, oh, Dr. Mike thinks MRV is everything. Like, no, it's in this particular case, it's important to, you know, so just a couple of, uh, you know, technically, mostly sort of modifier words like that can take you a really long way in giving good advice. But that can't possibly be perfect advice because you never can be sure of your own advice, nor are you sure of the own person's uh, stuff. And and just and, and on a note that I don't know if it upsets me or not, you guys, Omar, you probably deal with more of this than any of us. Um, radically under contextualized question like hey should I do front squats or back squats or like I don't right. know if you're a human being or not <laughs> I, I, I know nothing about you short of the fact that you have some sort of intelligence that has written this in a YouTube comment like I don't even know what your goals are and sometimes it can be frustrating as a person who tries to inject that sort of pertinent amount of nuance into an explanation where you're given almost nothing to work with and at that point it's almost like someone Someone is like tipping your hand into the area of vague generalities because, you know, what's the what's the correct answer to that? We're like, well, depending on your circumstances, I think both are excellent options for quad development and general lower body strength. Like that's not really an answer, though. That actually doesn't answer that person's question. But sometimes questions are unanswerable and you'd have to just do your best job of maybe at least getting some more out of them. I guess a real nice thing to do if you had infinite YouTube answering time would be like, can you, you know, you say that what I just said and you'd be like, can you tell me a bit more about your situation? You know, but yeah. then again, like that's for paying clients, that's, God damn it. <laughs> no, that, that, that would end up being coaching yeah what i've what i've gotten towards and, and maybe this can be helpful is when someone asks a question that is unanswerable like that i think all right what's the most useful thing i can give them with the time i have it's helping them understand why the question is unanswerable so often my response if you were to look at some of my instagram back and forth when someone's like you know should i be doing cardio for fat loss is to say it you know based on your question it seems like you think cardio just magically makes fat loss happen rather than it's a component of, of a diet. Here's what I want you to do, and I'll, I'll direct them to something. Or I'll just explain it in the most simplest way I can the problem with the question so that they can get a better understanding. Oh, like, oh, wow, that's, there actually is individual differences. Like, that's almost always what it comes down to, you know. Um, another thing I'll do when I get, like, cardio thoughts is I'll just, <laughs> like, if you want to know when I'm actually mad, but I sound not mad, it's when I say, what's the specific question? Oh, when I you can see me. When I you, can <laughs> anytime can someone asks me something and I say, hey, what, what, what's the specific question? That, that's when <laughs> I, I, it's useful though, because it makes them go and think about like, oh, what am I actually, like, what would I say to that? You know, like. <laughs> yeah, that, um, those are, those are funny questions in general. Like uh, people like, <laughs> like BJJ and lifting thoughts. I want to be like, I have an inordinate number of thoughts. I have book length level thoughts on it. It's, it's my life's work. That, that's what it's like. It's like, you know, like asking like a fucking engineer, like who built a rocket, be like thoughts on your rocket. Be like, what part of my fucking rocket? Like, well, Chemical you engineering crazy? thoughts. Yeah. yeah like, like doc, you know, Dr. Drew, like thoughts on psychology. You're like, <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> I, and usually sometimes sometimes I'll like playfully troll people back if they're hmm. doing that. I'd be like, like thoughts on cardio? I'd be like, it's cool. <laughs> and they're like – then they're like, OK. I see thoughts on me that. doing cardio at the end of my this and that. And like, ah, OK. That's a question I can answer yeah. in an Instagrammable form of data. Yeah. yeah. I like yeah. that false dichotomy of uh, questions where you said, Mike, where it's like this or that. Where it's like front squats or back squats. It's like, well, wait, wait a second. What's this either or in the first place that you're having me do without any context? And I, I actually, I used to, Eric, I give tremendous respect on the old Instagram where I see him. He's in there answering questions. After a while on YouTube, I feel that it's a slight sign of disrespect if it's a basic question that on my channel you could just search. And even with the algorithm, I'll make 
to, uh, content on topics and then I'll come back to them because YouTube does not, there's no great sort of mechanism with the algorithm was like, this was a really good video. Let's keep it that way. And that's kind of his response when it comes to something. But if they want to know the answer to a question, that's a very simple one. And they have not, you know, searched on the YouTube channel. Like you haven't respected my time. So then me trying mm -hmm. to take time to answer your question that takes more of my time. I could spend making more content. They'll reach 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 people in ways it's, it's a little selfish. So I, re I respect those, both of you guys actually, that are able then to go in there, go in the comments. I don't and answer, really answer everything, man. A lot of stuff I don't, a lot of my answers look no, cold. You got to draw the line. No, I don't feel so. Like I read your comments. I read both. Let me just say no, as the outsider, well. I read both of your uh, styles of comments. Mike, I laugh at yours. Uh, I don't think, I don't think there, I don't think there's anything wrong with that approach. Uh, both of the approaches. And I, I do think uh, you have to draw the line somewhere and the where you draw the line typically is related towards how much you're doing, how much free time you have. And as your platform grows, it changes. So there was a time when not only did I respond to all my comments, but I would respond to all of the messages I got. Oh, yeah. Um, and then it got to a point where I remember when Facebook was the main platform and the algorithm hadn't destroyed it as a, a useful thing for anyone. In the I world. hate that so much. <laughs> <laughs> where um, it, I got so many questions on there where I eventually I stopped going to my requests and I'm just like, All right, I, that, that that's just an inbox. I'm just going to, it's, it's already partitioned it for me and I'm just going to let that be convenient because it's just too much and I open it and I just had my blood pressure rise. Uh, but then Facebook chilled out and went to Instagram uh, and I also went rose commensurately with my exposure. And now... I look at it from the way you were looking at it, uh, Omar, is what's the utility? It's much more useful for me to make a post that's going to get, uh, you know, 2,000 people seeing it versus answering a single question. So now if someone sends me a private message and I do check my requests and like, for example, uh, I, I had I reshared someone posting that they bought my books and they were like, these are awesome. And someone was like, where can I get your books? And I'm like, uh. Oh. Nope, nope. You you can you like that you can You're read the title and Google this it. One. <laughs> yeah, like I, I I could guarantee that I would get X amount of money right now by sending you a message for two seconds, but I will not. I'm not going to reward the behavior of not so, hitting Google. You know, followers so now, are great for that sort of thing. Followers are amazing. I have fucking baller followers that straight up cut people the real deal. Some of them, like uh, a particular guy, it's, it's, it's rude to call them followers, internet friends of mine. There's a gentleman named Trevor Fulbright who is uh, like an RP, uh, RP clients member and he does jujitsu and he does lifting. And like he'll straight up, like somebody asked the question on one of my things every now and again when he's on it, he'll just super politely answer it for them. Like praise God that you're fucking here. It just every mm. now and again when he's not busy, he'll answer a question. There's like a bunch of other other guys that I know that'll just answer questions of people I don't know that'll just like answer it. Sometimes they'll answer basic super questions that are just a like, come on. Like, and sometimes they'll do a little barb there. Like you should know this. Or sometimes they're like, you yeah, know, you really, you following about. Dr. Mike and you don't know this. And, and funny enough, people respond with just like adorably innocent things. Like, well, yeah, it's why I'm following him is because I don't know stuff. And I'm like, well, geez, that's true. You know, like you, how dare you follow someone and not already know everything they know. So there's a, a sort of yin and yang to that. But in the end, it's really cool when your followers and Omar, this happens on your YouTube channel a bunch, short of like ankle or calf jokes or whatever that your, your followers seem to perseverate on. Um, it's hard to tell the difference between the ankles or calves, really. Yeah, it's, it's all... Yeah. One mostly non-existent singularity. It's a tibia. Area. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so undefinable. Yeah, but it, it's really cool when folks who are in your sort of community, uh, they can answer some of those basics, and they're sort of like, then it's everyone helping everyone, kind of, um, because yeah, because sometimes, man, like you know, you're not going to hundred thousand Instagram followers or whatever, you're not going to answer every fucking question. Certainly, you know, I always, I always feel guilty about Instagram questions because I want to like like most of the comments that I think are cool, and I want to answer s something that in some way, but I always feel like I'm being shorthanded and cold. Um, and they, so, if you just know me from Instagram, you think like, this guy's a dick. Like he just does like three word answers for everything but then you see me on podcasts and stuff and like oh my god like he seems sort of maybe nice and and so he always like he rambles excessively on answers why don't i get that on instagram and you're like oh that's right like he gets a fucking 150 instagram comments a day like of course he wouldn't even get through the first tangent joke he would run out of characters yeah exactly. so <laughs> you'd be After learning about walnuts and, and which ones are sharp and your anus and then nothing you like it wouldn't get it um, Whoa, walnuts. It was sorry, a bar. sorry Eric, I, what I, I, snickers bar do you guys have listen, in new zealand walnuts snickers uh, bars ones that are healthier yeah, because you guys are better. Because are better because you can rank foods. No, but yeah, I, I think you do have to draw the line somewhere. And where that is is going to be dependent on what you're trying to do. And for me, 
like one of the things I'll do if I is is private messages is where I where I draw the line. I won't respond to things where someone could easily Google it, uh, where it's like it's in my link tree. Like like you could have just clicked on my profile. Um, and then the other thing I do is that when I get a question, and I learned this from Andy Morgan, that I think because sometimes you get a question and it's quite personal and, and from the person and they they need help and they've thought it through and they're stuck and and you want to help them and that's that's great. Um, you know when when that when it's an intelligent. Or at least it's it's, it's a, not necessarily intelligent. It's, it's a non-lazy question that deserves anonymity. Um, that's when I'll answer it if, it, if it's within my scope. But when it's something that everyone could benefit from hearing the answer and it's a good question, I'll typically encourage them to make it a post on, on, on an article or ask it on one of my Instagram posts or do it in some public way. Or I'll just, or most of the time, let's be honest, I've already addressed it somewhere in the last 10 sure. years of my work. Sure. And I'll direct them to, hey, Google this. You know, um, so I, I think honestly, that was one of the major motivations for me, me making the muscle and strength pyramids was just to save myself time so I could just direct oh, people to videos nine, and go back nine, to playing video games. hundred percent, nine yeah. out of 10 reasons why I wrote 100%. all my books. Um, I also like, I like to in real life, uh, use the term, uh, use the phrase Google me as much as possible. And people are like, Hey, what's your name? Like Google me, you know, like, <laughs> as I walk to a first class seat that I didn't purchase. <laughs> <laughs> and then get kicked out. Sir, this is Google me. They're, they're, Sir, we're yeah. Googling you and nothing's getting you a free seat. Fuck. Yeah. Actually, you don't even have a seat on this plane. You're in an illegal area right now. <laughs> I do want to circle back uh, here and open the floor, actually, to Dr. Mike for a few different things. Uh, one, what I wanted to say personally, Mike, on this podcast, that by you opening up in that way actually makes me trust you more as a thinker, if that makes sense, because you're aware Fold of— another one, uh, baby. Uh, so worked is what I'm saying. And I— and I guess what it is, because I hold knowledge in high regard. And so when I encountered some of those evidence-based practitioners, let's just say not doing it for the good of the industry or for the good of the community, you see some of the, either the motivations or some of the lines, you see cracks in some of their thinking. And it's not as, uh, I think maybe it was Mike that said that, the fallen angel syndrome, where like, oh man, this guy's trash. It's more like, hmm, I should think a little bit more thoroughly about whatever this person writes, because now I'm aware of that. If anything, seeing you post that increases my confidence, you know, uh, uh, of the things that you're posting now, because it shows that self-reflection, that introspection that I think are very important. Um, yeah, no, sincerely. And what I was going to say, two questions uh, for you before opening up the floor. The first would be when it comes to, you mentioned your father, you actually mentioned your father to me before when we were doing the Shaco program. It, no, 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 no. I called you daddy in a very specific context. So that was, I was going to keep that private, but we just want to say publicly, yes, it was, a, there's a lot of after hour fun um, at Barbell Brigade. Yeah. Where do you think the Snickers came from, Eric? I Now now you see the connections. Yeah, it, it, did, it did seem like you guys knew a little too much about the logistics of that. Yeah. yeah. I said king size, and Mike was like, right, right? Oh, the, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and it was near Halloween. That's where all those bite-sized ones came from. Because right. oh, part of me, and I, I, this question would be, I guess, actually for both of you guys, uh, the role of you know your childhood and influencing the way you think. No, but your father, I'm like, well, you spoke very highly of him before and everything that he's done. Do you think that the influence that he laid upon you from growing up has been one of the major stepping stones for you with your own self-awareness, meaning that um, I guess I could say for myself, some of the influence of my parents in ways, not a stern influence, but when it comes to education or the way you think or, or thinking before you speak, or if you're wrong, you know, make sure why are you wrong about these things have really influenced the way that I ultimately approach the world. Would you say part of that is just yourself, your uh, academic credentials, the path that you've set upon for yourself, or were there other influences where, you know, for some of us, it's outside characters where people in the industry you brought up. I know uh, Thomas Sowell, uh, uh, you're a fan of, and then also this environmental scientist, where they reshape the way that you think of things. Was it just your own personal journey, I'm asking for both of you guys, or were there key figures in it? Because I think for a lot of viewers listening, that you two might serve as some of those figures influencing the way they think. So I was just bringing it back to that because I know you brought up, um, like, uh, your dad before um, with the Shaco program and how highly you speak of him. Yeah, yeah. Dad's a swell guy. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, hope he's not watching this. Just kidding. My dad actually watches a ton of my YouTube videos uh, wow. and interviews. 
Right. So um, uh, I'll have to give a very interesting answer. I sort of would disappoint if I didn't. Yeah. Um, one of my hobbies is psychology, you could say, but not uh, really personal psychology for betterment purposes, but uh, uh, a subcategory called behavioral genetics. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that sort of thing, but um, it's basically trying to answer why do people behave in certain ways and to what extent does uh, genetic influences or uh, there's several types of different categories of environmental influences that, that uh, pertain to your eventual adult behaviors. And they've studied this issue uh, really, really thoroughly over the last 50 years. And it turns out that the uh, influence on your major personality traits, and as a matter of fact, the influence on a lot of measurable stuff, that the, your specific, what's called your common home environment, uh, your parents and how they treat you within a range of normal environments like, you know, suburban, Midwestern or just suburban United States, middle income people. The difference that you, your parents input into you is somewhere between, uh, explain somewhere between, five, uh, you know, zero and 10% of the variance in personality, for example, and the best controlled studies point closer to zero. <laughs> um, so it turns out that the specific ways in which you were parented and lessons that you were taught is just not very clear that they sink in to any significant extent. It is potentially possible that they don't sink in at all and that you can have roughly interchangeable parents that just don't beat your ass and feed you enough and go you go to school and you'll have turned out the way you turned out through some combination of genetics um, in, intra sort of fetal wiring of the brain and also particular life circumstances and social hierarchies you've been in, so on and so forth. That seems to be the, the sort of common consensus of behavioral genetics right now. Um, are there specific quirks and things like that that my dad maybe imparted onto me? Maybe. Uh, I can't, I, uh, as a rational thinker, I can't delineate them from being genetically inclined. Like I'll do facial features that my dad does and I never learned from them because I didn't used to do them until I turned 25. And when I was 25 and 30 and so on, I did them more. I'm like, what the fuck? Like I'm just turning into my dad, which is very common for you know, being genetically related to someone. So I'm not so sure what, and also there's like a, a potential for fundamental attribution error there where you're like, well, I got these things from my parents. Like, how do you really know that though? How do you know it's not genetics? You're related to your parents. One really interesting uh, group of studies in this regard is they take, um, uh, people who are uh, siblings to each other, genetic siblings, and then there's also a person in the home that is an adopted sibling, and they try to measure how close uh, they are in a variety of different things. Uh, he's just, just say this out loud. Um, uh, adopted siblings are no more similar to their parents that raised them basically their entire lives, unrelated parents, than they are to any random group of parents you select from a general population. Like, uh, it's wild to think about, but the, the data is completely overwhelming. So... Uh, you know, what did my dad give me? He gave me a fucking Ashkenazi Jew brain. Thanks a lot for that, dad. <laughs> Zero athletic ability, tiny dick. My shit is basically invisible. So thanks for that, you asshole. Just kidding, sort of. Um, but but on a serious note, you know, um, I have a ton of respect for my dad. Uh, I could I could sort of make a story where I, I, I definitely wanted to ascend to his level of intellectual ability. Um, and, and part of that maybe goes along with some cultural elements, uh, although maybe it was just in my own head. I think more recently in the, in the last 20 or 30 years, um, uh, Eastern European Jew, Eastern European Jews have this like uh, idea that they're supposed to be intellectually, economically, and educationally superlative. Like you're not really a Jew unless you have a PhD or a doctor or some shit. Like you're oh yeah you're Jewish, but whatever. Maybe that plays a role in my sort of attempt to ascend in some sense. Maybe it was to try to be more like my dad and to impress him. It certainly means a lot for me. Like when I defended got my PhD, it meant a lot for my dad to shake my hand and tell me congratulations. It, it meant a shitload for him too. You could tell but it definitely meant a lot to me but is that was my dad sort of like somehow shaping me as i grew up it, so i would say it's by no means clear that that's the case and if i had to take a guess at it i would say probably not uh, but he's a super cool guy to hang out with um and i don't know I'll, I'll tell you one thing that i hope 
he influenced, but I can't tell if this is true. Um, my dad, when he wrestled me when I was a little kid, would always give me a real big struggle, but mostly let me win. And he would tell me that you're strong. He would tell me you're strong, you're capable, you, you can do things. And it, it, I'm not sure if the same ego in him that tells him he's capable and wants to tell other people he's capable is genetically is, is existing in me as well. It's probably true. But maybe it was also that he let me think those things so that I always, no matter what obstacles I faced in school and life and work, I had this underlying core of being like, I can fucking do shit. I am fucking capable. I usually win stuff because I have this sort of faint memory of usually winning. Uh, maybe it, it, that might not remotely be the case. But isn't that nice to talk about? So, One thing I would put forth is just because behavioral genetics um, suggests that uh, those things to be true that you've stated doesn't mean you can't simply learn from a parent in the same way that you would learn from a teacher in school, you know. Um, and uh, I, I would say that while I, I doubt just the fact that my, 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 my dad or my mom was my dad or my mom made me the way I am, I do think uh, them modeling certain behaviors and values pushed me intellectually in certain, certain directions. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Mike. Like Maybe. You, like you, you might have not pursued a, 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 an education. Like certainly we see it's much less likely for someone to pursue education if they come from a family that is not educated. And sure, they may not be educated because of genetic reasons. So it's, it's difficult to answer that question. But um, but I think we, we shouldn't in, uh, take the those behavioral psychology findings so far to say that humans don't learn. You know, which, sure. which is which is what you could. They just could might not that. learn a very predictable set of intentional traits that their parents try to teach them. I think sometimes parents may end up teaching you stuff sort of by accident, just by how they do stuff, and maybe instead of being like, "I, you're going to be a good person," goddamn it, like that stuff probably doesn't work because no. uh, humans are usually rebellious against their parents too. It might actually be yeah. the opposite. I'll, I'll tell you just just a super quick note to get maybe people a little bit to because it sounds like super fanciful stuff. Like parenting makes a very small difference. Think of it this way. Ask somebody uh, who has a higher chance of being an alcoholic when they grow up, someone who had perfect parents and they were never did a bad thing and he never knew the fucking evils of alcohol. So he fell right into the bottle and never got out. Or was it someone who had an alcoholic parent or grandparent or uncle who fucking saw what it did to everyone and was like, never. I don't know what the answer to that question is. It's not clear immediately what the answer to that is. Because if you look at the data, it turns out that, yeah, genetics aside, it's just not certain whether or not people, ideally you don't want alcoholics in your family, but maybe they actually make you less alcoholic. Just as a thought experiment, so when people ask you like, hey, what were your early influences and how did that affect your this and that? You might not know, because people who had no alcoholic parents would say, well, the reason I'm not an alcoholic is because my parents are good people. And the people that had alcoholic parents are like, the reason I'm not an alcoholic is because my parents were fucking showed me how awful that shit is because they fucking damn near ruined my life and I'll never do that to my kids. So a lot of that stuff is, is highly speculative and it, it's not even possible to figure out at face value whether or not the things you think affected you actually affected you as you thought. Yeah, and, and to be clear, I'm just stating that there is a difference between knowledge and personality traits and behavioral uh, genetics largely looks at things like Big Five and, and other outcomes and that that's not the same as um systems of thinking so you can be a rational skeptic who scores very differently on on a personality scale and you might have learned rational skepticism from a teacher or a parent or something like that yeah, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. but 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 not have and then that's not even been investigated in any study i'm aware of um but so i i think uh certainly a adopted child I mean, rationally, unless we're just going with the idea that humans don't learn, uh, might learn, you know, the, 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 the principles or the way of thinking or certain facts from 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 a, a parent, regardless of whether or not they they, they had their personality influenced by it. Um, just to put that out there, just just so people understand what what you are saying. And I, I think pretty sure what I what I believe you're saying. But um, yeah, so to answer your question, Omar, I think some of the biggest influences I've had and the reason why I've got there. Um, so my master's and PhD supervisor, John Cronin, um, always just basically made, just questioned my stuff and really kind of embedded within me the uh, the whole scientific method as, as a philosophy underpinning everything I'm doing rather than just the way you go about conducting data. Um, and, and being right or being seen as smart and definitely not being the goal. I think that it also helps with a big part of kind of like the New Zealand culture is um, people are 
probably humble to a fault here. And I think that that their research is just is like Americans. Of, yeah. So I, I think that actually really helps the um, the research community here. People are 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 typically very just curious, which is the, the right quality to have versus trying to find the big T truth. Um, which is cool. People change their minds a lot. People don't have super, super firm opinions. Um, so I think that's been a good environment for me later in life. I'd say earlier in life, um, some of the things that I've like knowledge and systems of thinking that I, that I, 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 I would guess I, I got from my parents uh, that they taught me was my dad is just someone who's intellectually interested. Um, but he also had a lot of blind spots. Um, and uh, I think that that helped me see that. And my mom has always been someone who has uh, tried to change herself in more from like kind of the emotional, uh, spiritual side, if you will. Um, and she's, you know, a marriage and family therapist and, 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 and been, a, been a, in, in psychology field for a long time. Uh, so there's this kind of this idea of self betterment, I think, which transcended into the knowledge as I got involved in um, academics. So that's kind of probably where the convergence was there for me. And I'm, I've always been someone who's a bit of a people pleaser and also of a mediator. So I find myself trying to find the, the good parts in two different opposing opinions. Like if I have two friends who are fighting, my natural inclination is to find the merits, is to steel man them both and then help each other person see the merits of the other person's argument. Um, this does cause problems sometimes when, you know, certain friends don't feel supported or when I'm trying to solve a problem and putting my foot in the middle of I things. Think, I, think, I think the exact same thing. Um, yeah. I probably so I'm probably not as there, proactive there, as you, but I really don't like it when people fight and I kind of want everyone to be friends. Yeah. And I think that combined with some of my, that I, I, I'm, I'm a skeptic by nature. Like, so th this, this honestly, I, I can't take too much credit for it. My mom tells a story where I went to a, uh, a magic show and she thought she'd lost me. She couldn't find me. She was looking around and the whole class was sitting there, children agape, looking at the stage. And I was peeking behind the curtain on the side of the, of the stage. And she had to come find me like, you need to go sit down. And I was like, I'm trying to figure out how, how he's doing it. And she's like, it's magic. And I was like, uh-huh. Is it really? So, yeah. <laughs> so, and then uh, apparently I never believed in Santa Claus either. I was just like half believing it. Like, dad, you're the one putting the, 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 this, the, uh, the presence of the tree. And I don't know that I, I, did, I didn't hear that story the first time and think, that's awesome. I'm a natural skeptic, like pat yourself on the back. I thought, what a terrible childhood. I, like, I didn't ever believe in Santa Claus or magic. I so. believed in Santa Claus. My grandma was tasked with waking us up. My sister and I would say, Grandma, wake us up when Santa Claus gets here because we want to see him. And she every year would say, of course. And then every year we're like, Grandma, what the fuck? Like we were like kids like you know don't have context we we thought grandma had failed us like <laughs> our grandma was a repository of failure and we we're like grandma like why didn't you wake us up we were like irate and she's like well you were sleeping so sweetly and i was like that's not a like my sister and i would look at each other like, what like we, yeah there's nice 364 other days right? in the year that's exactly what we thought yeah. like Santa Claus, are you crazy, Grandma? And it was like, in retrospect, I was like, damn, like, my poor fucking Grandma. Like, we were legitimately upset with her. What the fuck? You know, that's terrible. My reason for not believing in Santa Claus later was much more unfortunate. Um, when we moved from Russia to the United States, my parents were trying to save all their money in the United States to build a better life for us. So, like, that, uh, in, do Christmas in Russia because God was illegal, so you do Santa Claus on New Year's, long story. But that yeah. New Year's... We got a um, like uh, like two packs of gum each, and we were like, ah, okay. And I was like, that was good. Santa Claus was over. Like, like we knew clearly that. Santa Claus. Yeah, Santa Elves Claus. Don't make this. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it's, apparently communist Santa Claus was much nicer about gifts than uh, capitalist Santa Claus. It's got a series of receipts, but uh, you know, if, it's so funny too because by the time that my parents were making uh, enough money to relax their proclivities for you know frugality enough to get us amazing gifts we were already teenagers and like gifts are lost on teenagers you know what i mean like like you just want to go to like whatever john mayer concert and make out with other guys man that's what i wanted um but like mm. it's just one of those things like, eric you remember your first john mayer concert? Like, yes. <laughs> that's where my we first, met <laughs> my first kiss with tom at the john mayer concert <laughs> sweet boy. continuum uh, tom the right neighborhood. Guys. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's so, but it was just one of these things where I was like, I never really got like that full, like, you know, when Americans, you, you guys probably grew up like this, you have like an inordinate amount of gifts under the tree. Omar, how many gifts under the tree are you getting? 
Where are you going back? Um, zero. If we no, uh, definitely. I uh, like a bunch, like, right? Like eight, yeah. Oh, to be a kid now. Now, now the turn of the podcast in my mind is, oh, to be a kid again. How amazing would it be? Here, here we're navigating people trying to increase the way that they think or how they view the world, and that's why part of that um, dovetail, Eric, for that question actually comes. I don't know if you remember the conversation that I love that we had after your competition in Sacramento outside the parking lot when we were talking about influences where you just went in. I'm like, man, this guy is thinking about things. I'm loving this. And that's why I just wanted to circle back to all of us taking a hard look at ourselves. And I think, and it actually made me like, once again, when I saw you made that post, I've, I've made it in several videos where I'm like, man, when I look up and I actually keep some of the popular videos and I say like, these are shit, like some of the information's outdated, uh, to keep yourself honest, because if you don't, you start thinking like, man, I'm putting out this dope content. Look at, you know, the response. This and that's like, well, seven years ago, you were saying these things and you said it with such confidence out of nowhere that you need to check yourself. Um, before you wreck yourself, Omar. Yes, yes. as as they specifically, say. you want to you want to chickety check yourself <laughs> right. in that case. Uh, I want to open it up to you, Mike, with any closing statements. And before I do, I just want to remind you. I'd be remiss if I did not. Prior to us going live, you said something about a cult um, that you wanted to talk. Yeah, this yeah. will be my closing statement. Okay. On the note of not taking yourself too seriously. Right. Uh, in an alternate world, I've been known to occasionally do psychedelic mushrooms with my friends and just do nonsensical things that just don't hurt other people, mostly walking around parks trying to figure out why trees exist, shit like that. My friends and I have a bucket list item. We want to join a cult while on mushrooms and then like as the mushrooms wear off like six hours later, we just sort of kindly excuse ourselves out of it. But like I just want to – I want all that propaganda. I want that shit when I'm high as fuck because I want it, I want the experience. I'm clearly way too skeptical to be able to handle a call like normally. I want to be highly inebriated on psychedelic mushrooms to where I'm like, yeah, like I want to take one of those Scientology tests where you do like the thing with the um, – the different, you know, like the the Thetan tests and shit. I want to like yeah, go do it on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I hope I can get cleared. But like I'm on like five grams of mushrooms. It'd be fucking unbelievable. It's like a bucket list item. I have to do it. Cult. If you guys want to join a cult with me, you can come. You don't have to take mushrooms, but it's probably better for you if you do. I mean, you already are part of the Iron Cult, so and that's what Iron. I, I, we're all Iron Brothers, aren't we? Iron Culture brothers sure. and sisters, welcome and everything in between. Yeah. Whatever you are, we're here for you. Us and John Mayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Eric, anything you want to say in closing? Uh, I would say that I, I that there is one other influence that I've had that I think has had a big impact lately, and that has actually been seeing some people who I put on a pedestal be those kind of, not quote-unquote fallen angels. It's not like you totally dismiss them or cut them off, like you said. But seeing those cracks has made me realize that I – that my values weren't where I wanted my values to be, uh, that there was a point in my career where I was probably too in that kind of um, battleground, weapon sharpening, forum debate style, uh, you know, thing where it, somehow it was okay to be a rational skeptic, but then let people tee off on each other and do, you know, be condescending and do ad hominem attacks and, and let your followers all also just post memes and make fun of someone. Uh, and you could basically, it was like, rational skepticism but like a rap battle you know and you do you do, you do do the end zone dance on someone and that's fine um somewhere along the line i realized that i was valuing uh science but not necessarily like so long as you were right and you had science on your side you could be a complete ass and i didn't really realize where those two things didn't actually connect you know where 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 being an asshole and being condescending and treating people like garbage and attacking their character or attacking their intellectual prowess, I didn't understand what was wrong with that. And now I see like, oh, actually, straw manning someone's a problem. Ad hominem attacks are a problem. Uh, you don't actually, if you really want to do this right, you want to go out of your way to try to treat the person with respect, listen, uh, and try not to re react emotionally because you get closer to the truth because you can get a better understanding of their position because yeah, people are going to react, especially when you're publicly calling them names. That's human. 
Uh, and then you can't turn around and be like, oh, see, you're not a rational skeptic because I was a complete asshole to you, triggered you, and then you react like you were triggered. Like, yeah, it's kind of on both people. So, um, yeah, just just starting to realize that, that I, I value uh, the reason why we're trying to get to truth, especially in the fitness industry, a service industry, a uh, inherently positive industry we're trying to get better uh, it comes down to us looking for the similarities and the commonalities between us and treating one another with respect because we're all trying to get to better versions of ourselves in one domain or another and that that has to have an underpinning of respect uh, and that that just so happens um, to go hand in hand with rational skepticism and the true scientific method um, where you aren't leading with the ego so anyway um Seeing some people who I used to kind of put up on a pedestal, um, seeing them totally betray what I think is uh, intrinsic values that I that I want to emulate has made me really rethink what are the roots of my uh, kind of growth as a, as, a, as a science communicator. And it, it just made me really reevaluate all of my values, what I do, how I speak, uh, what sacred cows do I hold. And I've just looked to try to find and root those out. So I think that's been probably just in the last two or three years where I've really tried to assess myself in that way. Love it. I just want to say one final note. I feel like we've been talking shit on fallen angels and Lucifer is pretty badass. I mean, John Milton, paradise lost. (laughs) I've been a Satanist for years, you know, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. If you want to give a big ups to another angel, Edgar Allan Poe is for fell. It's cool. I, I just feel we've been shitting on them. This is the only thing. If I had one closing statement, give the big ups to the winged, uh, Wing beauties out there. That Lats. was my wings impression. Lats. Lats. Mike, where can people find you and learn more about Kit Kat bars? Oh, that's two separate things. Um, <laughs> RenaissancePeritization.com, at RP Strength on Instagram. And if you want to have a machine tell you what to eat instead of relying on feeble humanity, the RP Diet app is alive and it thinks and it knows and it's hungry and it's waiting. Wait a minute, that's our military defense systems app. We called it Skynet as a joke, but it named itself Skynet, and it's therefore oh. going to kill us all. Um, yeah, so RP Strength, and if you want to follow me on Instagram, that's R P D R M I K E. Uh, mostly, you know, mildly, mostly wholly nude pictures of me yeah. lifting weights sometimes in combination. Hey, well, as you saw when I slid into your DMs, I'm like, Mike, you're looking great, man. Keep it up. And that's not even a joke. I have, I've probably. I've probably sent you two messages in the last eight months. I'm like, Mike, keep it up, man. Looking great. And I meant it. So I consider you my coach for that reason. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what well, I'm I'm I don't know if you know this. I'm actually Eric's life coach. That's why I was there at his bodybuilding show. I was just give him positive self-talk before. Mm-hmm. And I said, remember, if you don't win this, you're worthless. Like just things like that, you know? Shit. People just have just, to know. Yeah. Just gems. The, the <laughs> gems. <laughs> Dropping gems. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening to these two Drop some gems. I'm going to link in the description for the podcast on iTunes, on YouTube, everything of Dr. Mike Isretel. I want to thank him for being on. I want to thank everyone for listening to another episode of Iron Culture, where we swear we're not going to give you the purple grape drink. We promise there's nothing in it. But you definitely, if you want to remain part of this podcast community, you need to drink it every single Monday. iTunes, Spotify, YouTube. Be there. Kit Kat bars.